to present that. Okay, we are now being recorded, um, <laughs> which is necessary. Um, so Mr. Keiter, did I see you somewhere to present for the application regarding to Bratton Court in Florence? Yes, hi, this is Scott Keiter, uh, 35 Main Street, Florence, Mass. And Jill Keiter with me and uh, ready to present when you are. Okay, go right ahead. Just to, we have, we have each have the file electronically, but so uh, if you could give us a brief presentation and description of the, the, uh, the relief that you're requesting from the zoning board, go right ahead. My pleasure. Uh, David, would you like me to share the drawings or, or just discuss verbally? I think it would be good to share them so that other people who are tuning in can see them, but we would want to do that through Carolyn. Carolyn, are you the one in the position to put them on the screen or? Um, Scott or, can do it. I made Scott him co-host okay, of good. it. He Perfect. can post it. Yep. Okay. Yes, please. I think that would be helpful for mm -hmm. other people who are watching so they can see the materials that you are describing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys, everybody will just have to let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. very good. Okay, so uh, at the end of last year, my wife Jill and I uh, acquired uh, this property. It's known as 5759 Main Street. It's a unique building lot because it has two structures on it. Uh, it is, of course, the building where Star Pizza is located here, uh, and, uh, and behind it is uh, to Bratton Court, uno unofficially to Bratton Court. Um, and so the, uh, our firm has been going through this property, uh, bringing, uh, re renovating and bringing it back to um, much needed, um, you know, current state. Uh, and so we've started with the residential unit uh, 57 Main Street, that's the second floor in the front. Um, as you may have noticed, we've also done the facade at uh, Stars Pizza. Um, we're work, we've worked with the city to do some outdoor seating for Stars Restaurant, uh, temporary outdoor seating. Uh, we're doing that as we speak. And our next uh, step along the way is to uh, rebuild this to Bratton Court. And so uh, what I'm going to do actually is go to the existing conditions drawing just to show this, this here is um, what is in place currently. Uh, th this survey drawing was uh, put together specifically for the work at the front of the building. And, and as such, we did not um, unfortunately show the driveway between these two buildings, but the driveway as it stands currently uh, spans from building to building. Okay, so that space there is a shared driveway for both buildings. Uh, so after review, uh, our construction firm has, has spent some time with uh, Jody Barker Architects reviewing the existing building. Uh, we've, um, as, as you know, this, uh, this building lot is general business use. Um, we feel given uh, this, small Bratton Court uh, that it's the best use for this space to uh, continue the residential use, the pre-existing nonconformity. Uh, we would like to put a second unit on top of the existing footprint. The structure will be new in its entirety, uh, including foundation because of its level of disrepair. Uh, we did sit in front of the planning board two weeks ago uh, and were approved um, uh, from their point of view uh, to do the project. We went through all of their, their areas of concern, uh, one of which was parking. And uh, <clears throat> the idea is that we would uh, provide one parking space per unit off street, which would be located where my cursor is. Um, the, the units would be two, uh, it would be two apartments two bedrooms each. Um, we have also received uh, permission from the DPW and are on the same page with them regarding the maple tree in front of the building uh, showing up here. Where is it? I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the proposed plan. I'm sorry. This, yeah, yeah. showing here. 
Um, so we do have a, um, a plan in place to protect that tree uh, as well as other, um, other items of concern like uh, open, uh, open space and um, I think some vegetation, some grass on the front of the building. Uh, but in, 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 in general, the idea is that the building profile would remain the same with the exception of a small jog in this back corner that we would be filling in and, um, and adding these uh, second floor egress stairs. Um, the, this is the front proposed front facade of the building. Uh, it would be a simple uh, a shed roof. Uh, we will be constructing the roof to be solar ready. Uh, it's our hope that we can fit into the budget um, a um, installing solar uh, with, at this time, uh, but at a minimum, it would the structure would be designed to accommodate solar and we would have um, conduit in place. Um, this is a side view from the driveway. This is the rear of the building. This by is the rear, excuse me, by rear, you mean um, facing uh, Cumberland Farms? That is not correct. The, yeah. Not Bradley yeah. Court. Yes. So, fa so facing east. Yes. This is east. OK, thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, and, and I believe um, we have a couple of photos here, just to give the, uh, some perspective. Th this here in the upper right, you can see how close Cumberland Farms is um, th to the back side of the building. Um, okay, and this is looking down Bratton Court. We have, uh, as part of our effort to clean up this side and add some outdoor seating, uh, this dumpster has been reduced to a from a four cubic yard dumpster to a two cubic yard, and we poured a pad directly behind the building to bring it in and um, and and oh. conceal it with some fencing, which is going up this coming week. And is then this photo here, outdoor I'm dining for the pizza place or something. Uh, what's that? This uh, seating area patio you're talking about. Uh, yes, we, we worked with Carolyn Mish and um, the folks at the mayor's office to do some outdoor seating for Stars Pizza. Uh, it's just a very small um, section along the building here uh, on gravel um, to to provide some you know seating for the patrons outside of the building. Thank you. And give them some more separation. Okay, and this this view here is just looking back down Bratton Court towards Main Street. And that, I think, is all I would have at this point. And I'm happy to answer any questions. OK. And any... if you, David, would you like me to take the drawings off of the screen or leave them up? Uh, why don't you leave them up? Because questions may relate to yeah. some of the specs. And I'll, okay. I'll just invite any board members who have questions for the applicant to speak. Uh, the the um, residential unit or units above stars above the pizza place. What is their parking? So they have. My wife Jill and I own a uh, unit at sixty three Maple Street where we are leasing them a parking space, but they also have one parking space uh, that is right in this area where my cursor is on our property. Oh. Let's go back to the plan hmm. view, please. Sure. Right. It shows the parking. Yeah, the one that has the two cars. <clears throat> yeah, that so one. They, yeah, they're, I'm sorry, I'm on a laptop. Zoom in on that maybe? Yeah, I will try that to do that. If possible. Sure. Okay. There you go. Maybe it'll be legible. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So then forgive me because this um, this overhang no longer exists. It was uh, removed as part of our renovation. 
Mm -hmm. um, but they're parked there to park uh, right. So, so they're going to be sharing this area here where it says Main Street LLC. And this area, this area here is for the restaurant. So the parking the, spot close to um, the brick building is for the brick building, correct? Correct. And one that's car. one residential spot. Yep. Yep. One car. And the, the reason that the loading area is where being shown where it is, is as part of our project with 57 Main Street, we are rebuilding. We've removed this overhang. It was a really unsightly second story porch. We are in the process of building a uh, landing that directs the, re the restaurant people uh, along where my cursor is and down to this direction. You mean the, the rear uh, kitchen egress or something? That's, that is correct. It's just all it is. It's not restaurant parking. It is for the restaurant tour. And, and they've been given this area here. And those two cars assigned, uh, those parking spots assigned to respectively the two units, uh, based on the square footage, there's only, they only, you only need to provide one parking spot for each unit, correct? Correct. And so they will need to just, every, whenever they get in and out, somebody's gonna have to move out of the way. That is correct. Yep, okay. Yes. As would be the case with, I mean, you know, it's, it's there's, there's a little bit of uh, community involvement required. Right, right. What, what do you mean by community involvement requires? Oh, just meaning that, you know, we'll assign a parking space to a unit, but obviously they're, they're going to have to, there's a front and back situation. So they're going to have to co uh, cooperate with each other. And so you mean community, the people living in this building? Yes. Um, there really isn't room for people to park in the street there is, is, I mean, when I walk through there, it's a very narrow street. No. So no, is, I, I is, is, say, par is parking prohibited in the street? Uh, that I don't know. I, I don't think you, you couldn't physically park in the street and, you know, and allow cars to get by. Right. You would be blocking the street. So as a practical matter, there's no parking in the street, whether it's, Post or not, basically. Um, and can you elaborate a little bit when you said the planning board, I think you said something like you worked out parking with the planning board, or was it as simple as confirming that based on the number of units and the size of the units, no more than two spaces are required under the zoning ordinance? Is that correct? I would, uh, I would. If if uh, Carolyn would be open to this, I would defer to her expertise. Sure, sure. we could ask uh, Carolyn. But, but yes, I would say that what I meant is the planning board reviewed uh, this parking arrangement specifically, and Carolyn did recite some uh, some uh, code that I was actually not familiar with. So I would ask her if she could maybe an uh, better answer the question for you. That would be useful because this is a this is an issue. Kind of, yeah, it's an obvious concern that if it's such a tight street, such a small street, you're doubling the number of units and I assume bedrooms. Um, um, and I, how, how many bedrooms are? What's the increase in number of bedrooms uh, from the existing one unit to the proposed two units? One bedroom. So you're adding one, you're not doubling it, you're adding one bedroom. No, and I, I mean, presumably, whether it's a single family house or, or two family, you know, you still could have two cars. Per family. Hi, um, is the public not allowed to speak yet? 
Uh, not yet, but you'll have, have the public okay, will have a chance to. All speak. right, because I do have a meet. Okay, I have to go at six thirty, but thank you. Um, okay, that's good to know. We'll make sure. Is that Lisa Palumbo? I recognize your voice. It is David. I have to meet a client. I have to leave here about six thirty-five to meet a client. So yeah, if I could just have a few words, but I have put some okay. thoughts into an email. <clears throat> To share my 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 neighbor Chris Kennedy wrote to Carolyn very detailed and I've also sent a couple of emails that could be shared with the board. So thank you. You're <clears throat> muted, David. Um, so I can just clarify for the parking issue. So okay. Um, there um, the um, in the general business district. Um, you can add on to a first floor structure, adding a second floor, and there's no requirement to recalculate parking. So whatever existed um, in the use prior to any kind of development where you're expand, you're bumping up a second floor, um, that's sort of um, an allowance without without needing to recalculate parking. So the existing condition showed. I, th I think what we would actually qualify is just one parking space um, on the site. Um, so even so, if the applicant instead of you know tearing down the building um, and and coming forward with um, a new building, if they had just bumped up a second floor, they wouldn't even be in front of the zoning board. They wouldn't be in front of the planning board, and there would be no conversation about parking. Um, so because the, of the way the zoning is and to encourage um, expansion upward in the general business district, um, there's sort of this incentive to say, okay, there's, there's surface parking around um, and, and we, don't, we still don't count on street parking either. So you can't claim on street parking per se, but, but if they're, um, so it's basically up to the developer and the tenants to figure out if they are bringing cars to the site, they need to figure out a place to put those cars. And in this situation, though Bratton Court is not, um, just, is not signed for no parking and it's not legally instituted in the code as a street where no parking is allowed. Um, I think as Scott mentioned, physically you can't park on the street because you would be blocking traffic. Um, so the planning board looked at that and they looked at the fact that the code says there's no requirement to add additional parking. Um, so, um, and they approved this as, as is um, knowing that yes, there's an existing condition where there's not as much parking as traditionally people assume is gonna be with, with um, a unit. Is it a possibility procedurally, Carolyn? to, I, I, I understand that physically people can't park on Bratton Court without blocking the street, mm -hmm. um, but is there a procedure for posting it so that it's clear that it's illegal just because of concerns that if there are four adults, you know, or, or more with two bedrooms in each unit, if there's some couples in there, they're going to have cars. I realize that the, the, the theory is in general business, they just have to find a place to park. But, yeah. but I think the concern here is that Bratton Court is such an unusually narrow street and, and fairly mm -hmm. densely developed for its short length that there's a concern that maybe people still might, at least on a, you know, to rush in and out or something, might just put a car next to the building and partially block the street. Is, is there any way yeah. to address that? Yeah. Um, so, um... The process for it, it actually requires an ordinance um, to be adopted by city council and typically it goes through the Department of Public Works um, because it's, you know, public street. So um, the city council, uh, if someone could go to a city councilor, um, a ward councilor, councilor large, multiple councilors and request that um, this street officially be signed as no, no on-street parking. And then it would go through city council. Once it's adopted, then Department of Public Works um, post signs on the street um, to that effect. Is there reason to believe that there'd be a problem con 
com with that completing that process and getting that signage, I, I realize we can't make it a condition, right, of our decision, yeah. because yeah. that's not our jurisdiction. But I'm just thinking, yeah. in terms of addressing some of these concerns about how narrow the street is and the in the slight increase in density for residential use of this subject building and the concerns about, well, where are these cars gonna be? And I know the short answer is they gotta find a place on Main Street if they can't fit behind in those two spots behind the building, but I'm just trying or in to- Or a private parking lot. Or yeah. rent, a, rent a space right. in a private lot. Um, right. I'm, just, I'm just sensitive to the concerns of the neighbors on Bratton Court because um, yeah. I walked through there this afternoon and it's, we all know it's super tight back there. Yeah. Uh, but let's continue. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just, just uh, I mean, I can't tell you how city council would act. It really is a matter of uh, council approval. And you're right. You can't condition a permit that's uh, subject to someone else's authority or approval authority. But um, we could encourage, just, the, encourage the neighbors and with the cooperation of the applicant to pursue yeah. that course of action separately. Ab absolutely. And then just to remind everyone, parking is not based on bedrooms. It's based yeah, on I, I square footage of um, units. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want, I don't want, I, it's a, thank you for mentioning that. I didn't want to mislead anybody, but I think in people's minds from a common sense standpoint, if there are, you know, four bedrooms, there used to be three, there are now, there are three that'll become four, but uh, that's a good, that's a good point of clarification. It, it, that's not how the ordinance works in terms of determining minimum required parking. Um, so, uh, any other questions from board members? Uh, yes. Um, Scott, could you, going back to your drawing, um, zoom back out and, um, go to a couple of the site plans. I'm, um, not familiar with the, I'm very familiar with the street, but I'm thinking about other factors. It, the dashed line, is that the existing edge of pavement? Uh, yes, it is. Or prior to your working on that. Um, so if that's the existing edge of pavement, it looks like there's sort of room um, immediately north of the uh, back end of one car tucked in by those stairs. What, what I'm thinking about is, the reality, um, as as David just mentioned, there's there's uh, what's required, and we are happy to see what you're doing, uh, improving these properties, and the reality of I've had a couple friends live on that street, and it's um, and uh, it's tight, and there's nowhere to turn around, and people get stuck, and trucks, etc. So the parking is certainly an issue, and um, uh, the other thing I was wondering about was the, was there any discussion with the planning board about the tree? Yes, there was. The, uh, not only that, but I have uh, from Rich Parasoliti at DPW, um, you know, we, we are looking at how we would protect the tree during construction. Uh, the, um, the idea here would be to dismantle the building from the inside. So uh, pulling the foundation inward, we, we, excuse me, we work with an arborist to, um, to, as we're removing the foundation to look at any root structure that's immediately against the building uh, and make sure that we address those roots uh, accordingly and, and in conjunction with the city's um, oversight and review. And then of course we'd use our normal tree protections as we do on Smith campus or anywhere else around, um, around the area when we're doing construction. You know, Thank it's our, you. Uh, that, um, that certainly sounds doable. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, specifically on the compatibility with zoning question, um, as far as residential use on the first floor. Uh, that is what is existing in this structure, correct? Even if it's, whether it's vacant or not, it has been a house. That's correct. Um, I would say it's been a house on both both the first and second floor. Mm -hmm. The portion yeah. that has some second floor to it. That's right. 
Correct. All right. That's all for me. I'd like to hear from other yeah. folks and DPW, et cetera. Have, uh, have we heard from DPW, Carolyn? Um, DPW didn't have any comments for the zoning board as it related to the nonconformity. They did have comments about just utility connections and um, tree um, protection details um, and um, details about measurements on the plan for the planning board. Um, so um, that, but nothing particular to the zoning board's review. Um, and then I'll also just um, um, emphasize that the tree being a public shade tree because it's in the right of way is under the jurisdiction of the um, tree warden. And so not even in the jurisdiction of the planning board. Um, and so any kind of protection or removal of the tree all falls under that jurisdiction. Um, and there's a process by which um, the tree warden has to approve and review um, um, the whole range of things. So tree protection, as well as removal, if a public hearing is necessary for tree removal and what have you. So. Is there a requirement for additional trees? Um, under this shade, under the um, Mass General Law um, for shade, public shade trees, um, the no, I mean, um, city on has the adopted. Uh, no, because it's not related to the parcel. It's all in the jurisdiction of the public shade tree. So the mm -hmm. DPW, uh, the um, city has adopted replacement requirements that are different than what uh, an applicant might have on a site um, for replacement. So yes. Thank you. Um, my, my one question. I'm sorry, David. No, please go ahead, Maureen. Um, thanks. Ha Scott, having to do with parking, because this is going to be a kind of interesting situation where these are the closest parking, the closest cars to the street. And as they negotiate getting in and out and potentially, you know, they don't know each other. There is one car from each of the units. Have Did you try out any options that would cut into that clear area for um for the, the front building that might be angle parking? Um, truthfully, no. You know, I, I think, I think our, our line of thinking has been to try to segregate the restaurant um, because they're, they're coming and going, delivering their products to people around town. And so we're trying to keep them free and clear and kind of promote a, a little bit of separation between this residential unit and, you know, like front of house and back of house type of thing. Um, and so, again, it's not being shown here, but the idea is that where this overhang is, is all being reworked to, to really make it a simple the, the, they walk out the back door, they go down a quick set of stairs and they're into their car and off they can go. And their back door um, is pretty much underneath where that overhang was? It, it is, yeah, it's actually, mm -hmm. it's immediately centered um, in the center of the building. So, so is that where delivery vehicles currently operate to and from yeah. the restaurant? Yes, so, it is. So that's not changing. And, and you're saying that, uh, it's basically just not available, for example, for two more parking spaces for the residential units. No, it's not. And I, I mean, as it is now, the, the they're very, very nice people. They, they completely understand that this is a an evolution of the property. Um, it's going to take some time, but they more or less have taken over that entire area. And at times they'll have at least four cars out there, if not more. Um, it's a family run business and they have a lot of you know, folks just kind of parking in that area, they, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. They'll be restricted to this delivery zone, uh, which was part of our lease agreement with them. And, and they, they understand and will comply with that. But so it's, so it's not going to be four vehicles back there anymore for the restaurant. They won't be able to do that. Okay. No, they're going to probably be able to have two. And how would you enforce that? It's in our lease. So they'd be in breach of the lease. They if would they, if they started blocking the part, the two parking spaces for the the two family. 
That is correct. That is correct. And uh, furthermore, they just wouldn't do that. They're very nice people, and they're they've been very patient with us as we've been remodeling their building. And um, all of this is to help them too. And and I think mm -hmm. that they they know that they understand that. I don't see it being any issue. Okay. Well, I know that the there's some neighbors who who feel otherwise. But um, if are there any other questions? From the board, we can obviously ask more questions from the board later. I, I do want to attempt to uh, accommodate um, Lisa Palumbo, who needs to 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 leave soon. Um, any other? We can circle back to board questions. But you, is everyone okay if we give yeah. Lisa a chance to speak? Um, Lisa, are you there? Proceed. Uh, yes, I am here. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Um, first of all, um, I'm you know. Thank you, Kiter, for making Star's Pizza look very nice. It looks beautiful now, and, and we appreciate that. Um, couple of things, though, is that the existing house at Two Bratton Court, um, my neighbor Chris Kennedy pointed out that he spoke to Mark, the assessor, and that Mark's take on both properties is that both the um, commercial building and Two Bratton Court um, are three bedrooms total uh, because there's an apartment above stars. So that little house at Two Bratton Court, currently, because I've had friends who've rented it, the upstairs there, uh, those upstairs bedrooms didn't qualify as legal bedrooms. Um, so, you know, it's more like storage space, no windows and so forth. Um, so the thought of it now becoming a four bedroom structure is just a little daunting on such a narrow street. Um, so I am definitely in favor of a sign, um, maybe not signs down the street because it's such a, a, a short street, but certainly a sign in front of Two Bratton Court reminding tenants there not to park would be very helpful. Um, I am concerned about um, you know, the outdoor seating uh, of Star's Pizza, that's where, you know, keep in mind that there are delivery trucks that deliver food to Star's Pizza that often block the street in various ways and absorbing that outdoor seating, um, you know, that's kind of where trucks park um, is another issue. Um, and I know that uh, Two Bratton Court has been vacant now for a while, but in the past when it was occupied, tenants did park on the street and did block the street with frequency. Um, so we are very concerned. Even when yeah, it's even it's when they knew each other. Because it's inconvenient to have to move a car. And if you're dealing with people that don't know each other, they're going to, they're going to push it because people aren't watching them whether it's on the lease or not, and maybe even a sign won't do it. And we all work from home. And excuse me, excuse me. Wait, 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 wait. Could you please ident on. just identify oh, yourself? Sorry, I'm, I'm hearing Greg. a second that's, speaker. That's I'm, Greg, my husband. I'm, same address. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, thank we're, you. We're, we're, um, go ahead, go ahead. It's, it's, my concern is it's just human nature. We've all been renters before. And maybe a sign might give us the right to be able to call the cops, for example which we would never want to do to say, hey, but meanwhile, I can't get out of my street. And so thinking that people are, that don't know each other, potentially four cars or even two cars of people that don't know each other, this idea that they're going to work together is completely unrealistic. But I mean, you know, just that's just, you know, that's typically what happens when people don't know each other. So certainly a sign at minimum, which I know is out of your jurisdiction, um, would be helpful. Would be helpful. And just and w one other thing is, which might also be out of this jurisdiction of this board is the inconvenience during the, the construction of the, of the, of this new, of this new building. We had our entire street torn up last summer and it was a, it was a real drag. It needed to be done, but um, uh, we, you know, the idea of having to accommodate builders well, that's day not... in and day. No, it, what is so? It's just it's just another it's just another issue with the narrowness of the road is when it, the construction's going on. Um, 
I, we feel like all of us who live here feel like we should be able to come up and down the street without any issue. So it's just right. the narrowness of the street brings up a lot of stuff that is unavoidable. Today, right. today a cement mixer was blocking the street. Um, so, so anyway, though, it's more, it's more about the parking. We welcome the renovation. Um, I would prefer to not see it increase in size because that increases the number of people on the street. Um, I'm worried about the outdoor seating for stars because I feel like uh, it's dangerous. Just it's, it's a dangerous little street to get in and out of. So that's my main concern. Okay, um, I might ask the applicant um, to respond, but specifically uh, one thought, I mean, I'll let you respond, but one thought I had is even if we don't have, um, if it takes a while for the neighbors through their city councilor, presumably to go to the council and get an ordinance to get signage for no parking, I would think Scott, that you could put up private signs along the front of the building, um, uh, even you know without waiting for the city it couldn't i don't think it could be on city property but it could be on your property signage so it, that's one thought it's not going to solve all the problems but it it goes a little bit towards what uh lisa's talking about and then um can you scott do you, can you address the concern that was raised about um, during the course of construction, uh, blockage of the street, because that does sound, I mean, I know how I'd feel if I lived on that street. Is that your, your company has an outstanding reputation, but I know how, how I'd feel if I lived on that street. Is, and and is there, are there times where that's unavoidable or should that always be avoidable that, that there's any blockage of the street during the course of construction relating to construction? Um, sure. So I, I would just like to back up and say, you know, Jill and I are invested in, in our community in Florence. We're invested in Bratton Court. And we acquired a property that has a building on it that, we, you know, we've scratched our heads to try and figure out what the best use is. I mean, general business would allow potentially a lot of uses on this lot that we didn't feel while they could be an investment for us or even an office for our own company, but potentially, you know, we just didn't feel that the, the, that the road called for that. So we've been trying to find something that's not only, you know, going to make financial sense for us, but also fit the community. So I just want to make that point. Uh, so this is where we landed. I'd love to do something even different and use more of this land as we could with the open space in general business, but we decided to stay with this exact footprint in an effort to try and minimize the change, the, you know, the effects on Bratton court. And so it sounds like we're kind of whittling it down to the parking. You know, we, we understand that it's a tight street and, a, and that, you know, we, that having these two cars front to back is not a perfect situation. Um, and I would, I'm committed to doing anything in my power to, uh, make sure that we, you know, that those tenants comply, including the use of signage. I'm happy to do that. We do signage on all of our uh, real estate in, in town anyway. Um, but as you can imagine, as a landlord, uh, if you're the person who's, if you're having, if they're having difficulties on site with parking, I'm going to be the first to know about that. Um, and we, you know, we work a football field away from here. So, uh, it's not, this is not like set it and forget it. it. I'm going to manage this real estate as I do all of the rest of my real estate. Right. Um, um, Scott, could, could you give some examples of some of the things you could, you could have done with this property without any permitting other than a building permit from the zoning board and the planning board? Uh, I can't offhand because we didn't spend much time uh, after assessing the area, but I would just, say that, you know, if we raised this structure uh, and built an addition on the back of stars or something along those lines, you know, we would be able to obviously do an approval not required with general business. So whatever, whatever right. general business would allow. Right. So um, maybe we, Carolyn can address it, but I think that would mean no setbacks, if I'm not mistaken, and, and no, no specific parking requirements. I don't know, Carolyn, if you can address that, if, 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 this 
building had been raised to the ground and replaced with a new structure um, that complies with general business. Is that no, no parking requirements? Or could there, would there still be some parking requirements? Um, so again, if, so if this building were demolished and um, a similar sized building were put in but had commercial on the first floor, office, right. restaurant, retail, um, and it was just two floors, um, it could potentially have gone through without a zoning board, certainly without ZBA permitting. Um, and if it were under 2000 square feet of new construction, then without planning board permitting. Um, the same would be true if you just, if, if you wanted to keep a second, um, just keep the building, but just add a second floor, it would not need planning board or zoning board approval um, at, at that point. And it, he could have also converted it to two units at that point, and it wouldn't have needed any permitting. Anything, any new construction that's more than 2,000 square feet um, would trigger um, a planning board permit. Um, and if he went three floors or higher than the third, fourth, and fifth floors, let's say, would um, you, we'd have to look at parking in that instance. Um, but um, anything um, second floor would not trigger new parking. So there'd be no requirement for additional parking if, if the owner had elected or does elect to go that route versus the one that's been proposed. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. I just and want I to understand the alternatives. I'd like to just respond can you, to- Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yeah, Bob is that Bob? Um, yeah, we, we can yeah. hear you, Bob. Um, but okay. I, uh, um, what we're trying to meet is like, whether this is significantly more detrimental. And I think that we're going all around in circles on the issue. And, you know, the, what the proposal is not significantly more detrimental, but that's what I have to say. So, yeah, and for everybody's benefit, Bob Riddle is calling in on the phone. He is um, an associate mem a board member of the, the zoning board. Thank, okay, thank you, Bob. And, and I think that's a good reminder that, that this, I don't know if it's even been stated yet during this hearing, that the standard that the board is obligated to apply in making a determination on this application is whether the proposed improvements would result in an outcome that is substantially more detrimental to the characteristics of the neighborhood. Um, but Scott, I think you were, um, if you remember, you were in the middle of saying something. Oh yeah, I was just going to make sure to respond to, uh, I think Lisa's uh, second question, which was, or, or her husband's question about construction, that's all. Um, you know, again, that unfortunately the building's been vacant, it's at a level of disrepair that requires construction, whether or not we're doing a full <clears throat> demolition. So we have to contend with that and it is a tight area. Uh, my, uh, you know, uh, what our, we're specifically not uh, repaving this driveway until after construction. So it is our intention to utilize the area between Star Pizza and this building as our lay down and, and work area. Uh, obviously, there will need to be some level of uh, travel to and from. And I would say that as we do with any of our projects, you know, we would need to uh, communicate and coordinate with the neighbors uh, to the best of our ability and make sure that we're not uh, irresponsibly building, but, but it is tight and it, it will be, uh, it's a difficult project in that regard. It is, right. It's a tight street. Can you address the construction schedule? How long a period of time are we talking about before your crew and equipment are off site permanently? Uh, it's our hope that we would start this project late in the late fall and we would see this being six months or less start to finish. However, the heavy lifting, the uh, concrete trucks and framing materials and things of that nature would be, you know, the first 90 days or so. Mm -hmm. 
Scott, um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, we would really appreciate if, um, you know, as this is likely to go forward, um, if you would be able to notify us in the morning on the days where, the, day you, the, the day before when you think the street might be blocked so that we could park like in the Florence Savings Bank parking lot for the day. Um, because like today I had an appointment and the cement mixers in the middle of the street and you know, it would be really good for us to, to know ahead of time. It's not that inconvenient for us to park elsewhere, but the random blocking of the street is very stressful. Yeah, we come and go, Lisa's a realtor and I work at home and the office and there's no schedule to when we need to come and go and we need to be able to get through. Yeah, so it would be good for us to know ahead of time, but. At any rate, thank you. Um, the, sign, the signage would really help to remind your tenants not to block the street, I think. I, I wouldn't be in favor of signs up and down the street, but um, certainly in front in front of number two. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, you. I'm, hap I'm happy to do that when, when, if and when the time comes for construction, uh, I will make sure that we're in communication with you and the rest of the neighbors and we'll, uh, distribute our construction schedule and, and make sure our project manager is in contact with you. Thank you. Sure. Um, are, are there any, is there anyone else uh, from the public uh, in the waiting room who wanted to ask about this application? And uh, you can raise your hand. Um, and Carolyn, I'll ask you if you can help uh, tell me if there's anyone else who is indicating they would like to speak to this application. I don't see anybody. Okay. Um, board members, uh, any other questions for the applicant? I have no questions. And uh, Maureen, I saw you nodding no, and I assume Sarah, uh, I got- No a, more I'm, questions, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Oh, so I, I'm sorry. Uh, can I, so this is Greg again from uh, Five Bratton Court. Um, you know, this might be a bit beyond Scott's control, but in regards to the the um, outdoor seating proceeding um, and talking about delivery trucks, it's um, it's something that needs to be um, expressed to the the the, the restaurant folks that three minutes is five minutes too long of them parking on the street because it's a it's a really inconvenient for 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 the drive for the for a delivery guy and for the pizza place because there's no now there's zero place for somebody to deliver food and if there's cars parked in front of the restaurant the only thing that the only place where they they're going to be like oh well I'll just park on the street here and like i said we are coming and going all day long so i would just appreciate if you got if scott if you would communicate with with your new tenants, the pizza place folks, that it's not an option there's a, and there's a, a, a zero tolerance for that because it's, you know, we dealt with it for many years and then it got better. And um, so that's it. It's a, so you're, so in an effort to do some outdoor seating, which will probably look really nice, you're actually making the practical functionality of our street harder as a result, potentially. So, it's just, you know, and you only have so much control. And the thing is, when people need to deliver food and get, get on their way, they're just gonna go, ah, I'm just gonna do this. And the pizza guys are gonna be like, oh, we'll just do it because we need our stuff. And before you know it, I'm trying to get in and out of my street because we have no schedule. It's in and out all day long. And so, so that's it. Just okay. appreciate whatever you can do to convey to them. I don't know what the alternative <laughs> is, <laughs> but, right. but it's not parking on Brad Court. I will do that. Thanks. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we might be ready for a motion for the board to close the public hearing uh, on this application, bearing in mind that once that motion is voted on and approved, we, um, we are prohibited from hearing any more input from the applicant or any, anyone else. But do, are we ready for that? A motion to close the public hearing? Have we, uh, we've heard from the proponent, uh, anyone to speak in favor and all to speak, anyone with concerns already? Yeah, correct? Carolyn, correct. Carolyn says there's no one else Thank you. waiting I'm, or asking to speak. 
Thank you. I move that we close the public hearing. Okay, a second. And again, I think Maureen, you, Sarah, and I are the voting members uh, for this mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're too. muted, Maureen. Although Bob could be. But, well, no, because I announced in the beginning when I wasn't clear about Bob's uh, status. Um, oh, okay. That it would be the three yes. of us. Second. And do I hear somebody saying something else? If not, uh, Carolyn, because it's a virtual meeting, we need a roll call on all votes. So if Carolyn can take the roll call, please. Sure. Um, Maureen Scanlon. Uh, Any vote? I'm voting to what? Close <laughs> voting the hearing. To Just close the, the hearing. Yeah. Come, oh, hearing portion. Yep. Yes. Uh, Sarah Northrup. Yes. And David Bloomberg. Yes, so that is unanimous and the public hearing is closed on this application. The meeting is still open for the next to continue here. Um, and uh, now uh, if we're ready, we could entertain a motion on the, um, on the application itself for the finding. Um, we could have discussion before that motion or after it's seconded before voting, but uh, I don't know uh, how people feel, Maureen or Sarah or Bob, your input's obviously welcome as well uh, in terms of discussion. I'm all yeah, right. Okay. I'm all, I'm all set. Um, so, do we have a motion to um, let's just structure it this way? Do we have a motion to grant the request for the finding as presented in the application? I could move to grant that. Okay. I'm happy to move to grant uh, the request as presented by Kiter Builders to rebuild the non-conforming first floor residence at Two Bratton Court, uh, map ID 17C198. Okay. With the expansion of residential use. Uh, right. To that rebuild non-conforming first floor residents to fully residential use, to two residential units. Yeah. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion before a vote or thoughts to put on the record? I appreciate the conversation about the issues that will impact the residents. And I think that the um, logistics the of having the two parking spots be to, uh, occupied by two different residents is not in our purview, but I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be a challenge. And I um, appreciate Scott's intentions to manage that as owner of the property. Thank you. Um, Sarah, any comments or? No. Okay, um, I, I just would like to say that again, and I appreciate Bob's reminding us, you know, kind of that the standard we're applying here is the standard we're always mm -hmm. obligated to apply for a finding and that is, will the proposed improvements um, be substantially more detrimental to the characteristics of the neighborhood, which is an intentionally broad phrasing, but um, I'm struck by a couple of things. Bratton Court is already one of the narrowest, mm -hmm. most congested streets I've ever seen in Northampton or Florence. And the pizza place is already there. And because it's general business, not that this is relevant to the decision or the analysis, but I, I note the fact that there are any number of things that the applicant could do with that property to Bratton Court without needing any special permit or finding which would be no less and possibly more con congestive uh, on, the, on the site, although that's not technically part of our analysis. Um, right. and, um, um, and it sounds like the applicant is willing to put private signage on, on, on the applicant's private property. You can't put signs on public property, but you can in front of your building on private property. In fact, I think I heard Lisa say she doesn't even want signs up and down the street because that is an option for the neighbors that was discussed to go presumably through city council or their counselor to get, to, to get signage for no parking. But the applicant has indicated that, uh, you know, that he's willing to, uh, 
to put up private signage as a notice to the neighbors. Um, I guess that raises a question, do we amend do we amend the motion to add that as a requirement? Um, uh, my sense is that the parties involved are comfortable with each other and, and trusting each other to do what they're they're willing to uh, what they say they're willing to do. So I'm not sure that's necessary, but I, I note the fact that I think it would be helpful if the applicant would, you know, adhere to that suggestion that you know that Scott has already said would be acceptable, and that's some signage on the front of the building. And then he is the applicant has also said that you know the the lease the tenants the commercial tenants there would be enforcement of the of the of the uh, uh, with respect to the commercial tenants of not blocking and so on uh, construction phase construction is always m messy I mean you just can't avoid it there's large equipment that's necessary but um, again I don't think any of these things rise to the level of a necessary amendment to the motion or meaning formal conditions to an approval. But um, I appreciate the fact that the applicant has offered to communicate regularly and with as much notice as possible uh, for any times that there might be a blockage of the street and otherwise to keep an open line of communication with the neighbors in an effort to maintain a, you know, a neighborly relationship. Um, so I guess my question, for Maureen and Sarah is, is there, do, do, do any of us feel there's a need to amend the motion to add a condition to, an, to this approval, yeah. either requiring the signage, we can't do anything about enforcing leases. And I don't mm -hmm. think we can do anything about giving notice to neighbors. Um, but the signage is one thing that, that we could make a condition. See, so Carolyn, yeah. am, I, is, am I speaking correctly? A, pri a, so a, pr a private no parking sign on the front of the building on, on the applicant's private property? Yes, I mean, that could be done. And I, and I agree that, you know, conditions about construction time and that kind of thing are not in, in we're, your we can't We can't do that. Um, but, uh, but sure, if you think this sign, you know, no parking um, for the street, um, you know, in front of the house is is. Yes. Could be a condition. So, so do we do we have an amendment? Uh, I think that's the way to do it. Amend an amendment to the motion to uh, add the condition that a um, there will be. Uh, I suppose we could say at least one private no parking sign placed and maintained by the applicant on the applicant's property on the west side of the building facing the street, indicating no parking, and so. People don't have to repeat all that. Maybe we could just have a. So moved. Okay. Thank you. That I, I was I, I was I, headed I, in the same direction. <laughs> you know, requiring uh, at least I one. I wouldn't require more than two. Um, and the placement is really the kind of thing you decide in the field. Right. Okay. I don't know if we did that correctly procedurally. Did we, Carolyn? <laughs> uh, we amended our motion. Is that, yeah. Uh, okay. That works. So the that works. Are... So Go the ahead. safeguard with that is that will travel with a subsequent owner. Correct, because the permit gets recorded right. in the the uh, the finding the decision our decision gets recorded in the land records, and this would be okay. a condition in yeah. our decision that is recorded permanently in the land records. Okay. So uh, I guess Maureen Carolyn, do we do a second. roll call? Oh yeah, Maureen, can you second the uh, amendment yeah. to the motion? I will. I second okay. it. And then I, a roll call, a roll call, um, Carolyn, on that vote, please. Uh, sure. Sarah Northrup? Yes. Maureen Scanlon? Yes. And David Bloomberg? Yes. Uh, Carolyn, now I'm confused. Did we just vote on to amend the motion or did we vote on the motion as amended? You, you voted as amended. Okay, so that so that means that's unanimous. So that's, so that's unanimous approval, subject to that one <laughs> condition, yep. um, Scott. So good luck with the project, and uh, um, we appreciate your uh, your willingness uh, to uh, to work with the neighbors as closely as you can. Um, My pleasure. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank, I, thank, thank you. you. Um, and Scott, you know the drill. The, there's the appeal period, and then. Um, and then the, the from 20 days from the date the decision is issued to the city clerk, 
And after the expiration of the appeal, it needs to be recorded uh, with a certification from the clerk. You, 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 I don't have to tell you this, you do this all the time. Um, uh, I, I, could we just take uh, like f a five minute break and we'll continue at six or even a four minute break. I, I, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, could, can, uh, can, can, uh, do you want, it's 643, can we reconvene at, uh, We'll continue with the next item on the agenda from the uh, continued from August 12th, and that's the application for a special permit by Jen Pollins to expand a pre existing non conforming setback further into the side yard at 32 Maple Street, Florence, map ID 23A 139. Uh, the same procedures will apply. We'll first hear from the applicant or her representative. And um, then the board will have a chance to ask questions and then uh, members of the public who are present will then also have an opportunity to address the board with questions or concerns about this application. Um, so uh, who do we have for the, for the applicant? Uh, hi, Attorney Lester, if you could just unmute, we'll, we're ready to go with a presentation of Hey, my name is Thomas Lesser. I'm from the law firm of Lesser, Newman, Alio, and Nasser in Northampton. And I represent the applicant, Jennifer Pollins, in this matter. The property before you tonight is located at 32 Maple Street. It presently consists of a single family dwelling, which is directly on the street. That single family dwelling is non-conforming because it's nine feet from the property sideline. And that's less than the required 15 feet, which is the required property sideline setback. Behind the house is a garage slash studio. It's a one structure. The first part of it is a garage and the back part of it is presently a studio. It's five, five feet from the property set line and it will become non-conforming if the request, which is before you tonight, to convert it into an accessory dwelling unit is granted. Accessory dwelling units require a 15 foot setback, sideline setback. So it will only be five, the house will only be nine we're here before the board on a request for a special finding, special permit under section 9.3A, subsection 10. As Carolyn Mish has explained to the board in her emails, Ms. Pollan's house is non-conforming with regard to the 15 foot sideline setback requirement. And that non-conformity will be further expanded if the requested accessory dwelling unit is allowed. Section 9.3a, subsection 10, states that a user structure may be changed when, quote, the zoning board makes a finding that the change, which includes new zoning violations, such as reduction of open space, new setback encroachments, which is exactly the situation here, or further encroachments into the setback will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structure. The keywords here are substantially more detrimental and you talked about that in your last hearing, not just detrimental, but substantially more detrimental. So to begin, I'll address the issue of whether the change in use from an existing studio to an, exist, to an accessory dwelling unit will be more substantial. It will be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. I begin by pointing out there will be absolutely no changes to the exterior of the structure in question. There'll be no extension of the structure. There'll be no exterior changes of any kind. The only change we're requesting is to the interior of the studio to allow us to put in a bathroom 
and a kitchen, which would make it an accessory dwelling unit. So I suggest the question before the board is whether a change in use from a studio, which can have classes as much as the applicant wants, to an accessory dwelling unit will be more substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. I'd point out that accessory dwelling units are allowed by right under the recent revisions to the zoning bylaws. And actually two dwelling units would be allowed by right on Ms. Pollan's property, but she's not planning to do that. She simply wants to convert her existing studio. I'd also point out that the project requires site plan approval and Ms. Pollan's already applied for and was granted site plan review. In granting site plan review, the planning board specifically found that the proposed change met all the prerequisites of that review and approval. Planning board found that the accessory dwelling unit would not be seriously detrimental to adjoining premises since the footprint outside and entrance way of the present garage studio would not change in any way. That the change in use would protect the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian traffic within the site and on adjacent streets. Third, there'd be no change to the relationship between the structure and open space since the structure is not being changed. Fourth, that an accessory dwelling unit would protect the general welfare by helping to alleviate the shortage of housing in Northampton. Second, fifth, there'd be no overriding or negative impacts on city resources. And finally, is that the accessory dwelling unit would meet all sustainable guidelines. Now, in order for the board to better understand the project, I'm going to share, hopefully, Michael Alley is going to share with you, who's in Maine, a number of exhibits. The first is a site plan. The site plan is up now, and the site plan shows the driveway, shows Maple Street at the bottom, then it shows the driveway, which the applicant by deed shares with her neighbor, Catherine Robinson. It's a deeded shared driveway. And I'd say that it's been a subject of conflict with her neighbor for several years. And her neighbor has objected to various aspects of her use, but it's a deeded right, a deeded driveway, and she has the right to use it. You can see there's a cobblestone portion, and that goes on to Ms. Pollen's land. And that leads to a structure which is called labeled garage in the back. But it actually, the structure labeled garage actually contains the studio I was referring to earlier. And that's clear from the second exhibit I'll show you, a floor plan. And that's a floor plan of the back building, which was labeled garage in the site plan. And as you can see, it has a garage with two cars depicted in it. And in the back, it has the studio. And it shows where the kitchen would be. It shows where the driveway would be. Now, an issue for the neighbor is parking. So I'd like to show you some photographs. Well, before I get to that, I'd like to show you some photographs which show the driveway itself. You can see the driveway here. To the right is the neighbor's house. Behind their house is a large barn. And to the left, is the driveway as it goes on to the Pollens property. And you can see the garage itself, which is in white. So as you can see, there's a barn between the garage slash studio, the Pollens garage studio and the neighbor Catherine Robinson's 
house. And this second photograph that I'm going to show you corroborates that. Um, I think you missed the photograph, Michael. Sorry, Tom, I'm looking for it. I think I might not have it. Okay, in any case, there's a photo, it would have been a photograph taken from the front of the door, the front of the garage in the back towards the house. And it would show that basically the barn blocks the house almost its entirety the, from the Apollon's property. Now I'd like to talk, talk to you about parking and, and that's, that's this photograph here. Michael just found it. You can see the barn. This is taken from the front of the garage towards the Robinson house. And the garage is what's visible. And in back of the garage is the Robinson house behind those trees. Now moving on to parking because that's been a big issue for the neighbor. I'm going to put up two photographs and show you a video. And I'm going to start off by showing you a photograph of the cobblestones. And these are, this is, this is land which is owned by Ms. Pollins. And you can see from this photograph that you could fit three or four cars if you park in that direction. And you could also put two cars in the garage if you wanted. So there's more than ample parking. There's actually potentially six parking spaces. And Northampton zoning only requires three parking spaces. And now I'm gonna to try to show you, so parking is really not an issue. There is plenty of parking. So we're gonna to try to show you a video now which shows that, and this is the parking area. You can see it's moving along the parking area to the garage. Then it's moving along the front of the garage. And then you can see the fence where the border is between the two properties the fence that goes up. And then this is it. This is a looking at the street from the garage area. And you can see all that parking that's available. There are a number of other issues brought up by the neighbor, which don't bear on the matter before the board. I'll address one of them. And that's the, that they note there's a cease and desist order. And Ms. Pollins admittedly constructed a bathroom before all the required permitting was in place. And she was issued such an order. But the building department has also agreed to take no further action until a decision is made on the approval of the accessory dwelling unit. If it's approved, there'll be an inspection. If it's not approved, the bathroom will be removed as required. In closing, I'd emphasize the standard for a finding isn't just that the project will be detrimental to the neighborhood, but substantially more detrimental. Substantially more means not just a little, but considerably. So unless you find the change from a studio to an accessory part, apartment, accessory dwelling unit is of considerable harm, uh, Ms. Powell should be granted a finding. I'd also point out that Ms. Pollins intends to construct a six foot, 50 foot long fence along the length of her backyard to alleviate any, to alleviate the impact on the backyard. This is the maximum height of a fence that she can struck, could construct. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, I'd note that um, if the findings denied, Ms. Pollins' option is to have a forklift come in 
pick up the garage studio structure and move it 10 feet away from the Robinson boundary. Then it would absolutely be allowed as of right, but it would also be significantly more visible to our neighbors and significantly more of a detriment on the neighborhood than leaving it where it is right by the neighbor's barn. So that's what I would say at this point in time, and I appreciate your consideration and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, we'll start with uh, any, uh, uh, again, other parties and their representatives will, will have an opportunity to uh, address this request. But we'll start with any questions from the board members. And I think we're just down to Sarah and Maureen uh, and myself as the three voting board members on this matter. A reminder, because it's a, this is a special permit, um, this would require a unanimous vote of the board to grant. Um, um, Carolyn, if I have that correctly, I think I do. Um, uh, correct. OK. So. Um, uh, any uh, board members, any yes, questions? Yes, I'd like to uh, ask, maybe it's uh, Mr. Aleo to um, put up a site plan again. I appreciated the photos, um, but uh, one that shows those property lines. There we are. Thank you. So when I saw the photos, looking at the garage, the face of the garage, I saw two overhead doors. Uh, to the right, there was a picket fence. Um, uh, can you zoom in on that a bit? Thank you. There we go. So, um, Gord is it Gordano? Giordano, maybe? Giordano, thank you. Um, so perhaps it's their flower garden or something. Um, or maybe that gate is just in, maybe the gardening is just tight to the garage there. Um, hard to, yes, I see a little gate. No. Oh, and then the, the fence must be running parallel to the garage. Um, is there along that, let's see, is that the north side of the garage to the right? Yes, uh, along that north side of the garage, or is it, Windows, doors, any access, any walkway? No, there's no access, there's no walkway, there's no windows. Thank you. Looks like there's looks like there are windows. Looks like a couple windows. Oh, there is a window in the garage. I'm sorry. Yeah, it looks like there's another window further back as well. There's no access. Right. Oh, right. That's that's what I meant. So there's windows but no doors. Um it seems like, as far as zoning board, uh, zoning compliance, I'm not particularly concerned around the other sides of this structure. It is uh, specifically uh, where we are close to the side setback. Can I have that site plan again, please? Thank you. All right, so I understand there's been some contention and I know there can be a, uh, I don't know if everybody's dealt with problems, um, but uh, with, with uh, uh, being uh, in, in close quarters with something like a shared driveway. Um, is What's the date on this survey? Is this new or uh, all parties were aware of it, aware of the uh, of these property lines historically? Is yes. That true, Attorney Lesser? 2019 is the date of the site plan. Thank and you. I would note that um, Ms. Pollins is certainly willing to put up a six foot fence to shield the windows and the property from the Giordano property also. Oh, was, has that been requested or discussed at all? It's offered. It's offered. Okay, we haven't heard. It's all, it's so all. maybe we'll hear from. Uh, we'll we'll get to hear from if there's someone uh, from neighboring property owners 
would like to speak, but uh, that's all I have for the moment. Um, I will um, disclose that I uh, know one of the abutters, the person who's filed a grievance, Kathy Robinson, we volunteered for several years together on a as long-term care ombuds persons. And I don't see it as any um, factor in my ability to uh, review this with objectivity, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'm curious about the, I guess the building inspector has not um, gone in there yet. I'm curious about the the square yeah. footage of the of the unit, the new, the second unit. Well, I can tell you that it's that it's less than 900 feet. I believe in my application. I try to reach it. How many feet it actually was? I think we have actually 21 and 25 and four. Seems to be the two measurements. Looking at the sideline of 25 something and 24. Okay. And it doesn't maybe this is not, I'm not, I don't know code on this level, but it does not need a second egress. My understanding is it does not need a second egress. But I think she would have to comply with, in order to get a building permit, she'd have to comply with code. If it needs awesome. a second egress, a second egress would be put in. It would be put in on the side, the yard side of the property, certainly. In emergencies, uh, uh, window sills are don't have uh, shouldn't be too high. The code uh, allows a, a window can be if it's fire first floor, egress right. if it's if uh, it's first floor works. Yeah. Okay. For that purpose. Right. I, I don't think that issue is before us because as attorney right. Lesser said, they to get a building permit, they have to comply with code. So that would be governed through that process and enforced through that process. Mm -hmm. Right. Anything else? Not now. It's, uh, okay. Right. It's Not now. Folks. So why don't we um, open it up to... Um, other parties who would like to address this application. Um, I think I see attorney McLaughlin, perhaps we could start with him. If you need to unmute, sir, and then, uh, you're still muted. Still muted, uh, there should be a button somewhere. He has a screen. button, I think he has a button, that's what I did. Right. Wiggle the mouse and there'll be a little- Okay, there we, there we go, we got you, we got you. Good, loud and clear. Um, I, I appreciate, I, um, I represent Ms. Robinson, we've talked about, the neighbor next door who owns the driveway uh, and that is used for this property right now. Um, I've put in a memorandum in opposition. I don't know if anybody's read it, uh, but uh, the, the gist of the memorandum is that you are never gonna get to a finding on this property because the ordinance that they're saying that they can use to get a finding has nothing to do with this property at all whatsoever. Anyone who can read English, you know, could tell you that. I, they're trying to confuse you. They're trying to mislead you. Um, they talk about the planning board. At the planning board, please understand, Attorney Lesser said that the garage was a non-conforming structure. It isn't a non-conforming structure. I took him at his word and didn't look it up for the planning board. But at the planning board, the understanding was, oh, it's a non-conforming structure. They're going to go ZBA to do a finding. But when we come to the application for the ZBA, they, they admit now, oh, it isn't a non-conforming structure. But we still want to use the statute for non-conforming structures. We should never, ever get to the finding in this case. Please understand, the statute that, that he's referencing allows you to change two things, and only two things. It allows you to change a pre-existing non-conforming structure or a pre-existing non-conforming use, okay? Read your definitions of structures, read your definitions of single family structures. They don't include separate and distinct structures on the same property. 
the only way we could be here with this application would be if the statute said um, you can change pre-existing non-conforming structures and other perfectly legal structures on the same property. But that's not what the statute says at all whatsoever. You can't use this statute to reach a so-called finding. The, the building that is non-conforming is the one family structure. And that is not the building that they're asking for changes on. They're asking for changes on the garage, which is a perfectly legal structure. It's five feet away. Garages have to be four feet away. So they can't come to this board under the statute that they've come to you before and seek any relief at all whatsoever. They, can, they could come to this board under section 10 and ask for relief to change the single family structure, but they're not. They, they, they just want to change a different building on the structure, which is a perfectly legal structure. And they want to make that a single, a second home. The city council passed an ordinance not too long ago that says that if you wanna build a second family home on your backyard, you can, but it's gotta be 15 feet away. So they're coming in here and somehow morphing the, the front building into the back building, but read your definitions of single family structures, read your definition of, um, of structures. These are two separate and distinct structures. And when it comes to non-conforming use, there's no non-conforming use here, at a, either in the single family structure or clearly in the garage. The single family structure is over the line, okay? So it's a non-conforming structure, but the use in that structure is perfectly legal. They're using it as a home. Non-conforming use is where you have, like I live in Florence, around the corner from me in a residential zone is an old store, but it's been there a hundred years. So it's, and the building is probably perfectly legal, but that's a non-conforming use. Non-conforming use is where you're doing, oh, uh, commercial or industrial in a residential zone. It has nothing to do with using a building for a legal use where the building is a non-conforming structure. They're morphing the two into the one uh, claim and it isn't. There, there's no way this statute can be used for what they are seeking by the plain language, read it. it they're, they're, and it's, it's, it's clear to me that the statute itself doesn't even cover accessory structures. It only covers the single family structure. It says a pre-existing non-conforming structure or use. That's a pre-existing non-conforming structure, like the single family structure, or pre-existing non-conforming use, which there is none on this property at all whatsoever. There never has been. It can maybe change, extended or altered, and then it goes into how you can extend or alter it. But that's all you can change. You can't change other structures. It, it would be a nightmare if um, you allowed this. There are so many uh, structures, especially in Florence, where there might be you know, a, an old garage that's like a couple feet away or, or a barn that's, you know, once, so what they're saying is once you have some kind of nonconformity, you could come in and just with a simple finding that it's not more substantially more detrimental, you can do whatever you want. You can just ignore every single ordinance and just get a finding and everything's done. Every garage would be every, every there would be a new home in every garage if you did this, because that's not what the law says. The law is clear and they're just trying to confuse you. There, there's this, it says a non-conforming structure. This garage is not a non-conforming structure, even though they told the planning board it was. And, and when it comes to the, the finding, I'll, I'll get to that. But, you know, at the finding, we, we said there's, there's problems with the parking. And, and the applicant said, I never parked. There's never four cars parked in back. With my memorandum, you see photographs of four cars parked in back before we put in a second family house back there. It's already troublesome. And or we never park on the... Uh, on the driveway, you see photographs of cars parked on the driveway. I mean, my client does own the driveway. There is a deed of easement, but it's for, it's for going across only. It's written in a very specific way. You can't park in it. It's not an, it's not allow you to use the right of way. It's only to go across and come back. That's it. And it's already a problem. If you put a second family in there, it's going to be a horrible problem. And when it comes, if you you should never, as I say, never ever get to the detrimental issue, but if you do, it's not, is this substantially detrimental to the neighborhood? The word more, more is, is the key. More defines, uh, is, is it substantially, substantial defines more, not detriment. We don't, we're not looking for substantial detriment, substantially more. 
And, and if we read this crazy statute that they're saying applies, it tells us to, when you, when you are weighing the finding on this, you're supposed to weigh the, if, if they're using it the way that they want to use it, which makes no sense at all. If you, if you did it that way, you're supposed to measure what was the detriment of the single family structure, which isn't much, it's across, the, there's a driveway and there's some land. What is the detriment of that being too close compared with putting in a second home in the garage? It's not comparing, as Brother Council said, you know, the uh, using the garage as a studio to using it as a house. You're stuck with this statute that you brought forward, and it's not the right statute. There is no way this can go forward just reading the plain English language. It reminds me of a case, you know, in the city, I know disagrees with me. The city disagrees with me, and they'll say, go ahead, you know, we want more you know, with, you know, people crowded into Florence and we want more housing. So just, you know, please just give them the finding, you know, but this is just like what occurred in 2019 on Dewey Court. Okay, in, in 2019, uh, there, that was a finding that you gave for a non-conforming lot. The lot didn't have proper frontage. And the developer came in and said, I want to put in 15 more units on this lot that has a single family house. I'm going to keep the single family house. The finding said in its language of the statute, it said you could only give the finding if the new use didn't require more parking. The city planning board gave you a memorandum that said, give us the finding in writing, which seems moronic to me, but and you guys gave it to them. You just rubber stamped it. I mean, this is the same thing. And what happened on Dewey Court was the, the people hired me after the hearing and I appealed it to the land court City lawyer knew they were dead. Applicant's lawyer knew they were dead. And what happened was they came back and changed the ordinance. So and there's always that, you know. I know the city wants a new home in every garage, but to do that, they can't do it with this statute because the plain language of the statute simply does not allow it. And, and when you get to the findings, if you ever get there, you shouldn't, but measuring the detriment from that single family structure which has been there forever, with the detriment of making the garage into a second home is more. There's more, there's substantially more detriment. It's not substantially detrimental. Don't think that way. Is there? Is it substantially more than there is now? It clearly is. For the main reason is this is not just a normal garage. They have to share the parking, excuse me, they have to share the driveway and it's already a problem before you put a second home back there. And if you ever get there, which you should never get there, but if you ever get to the finding issue, you should think that there should be more parking on the other side, uh, away from my client, and a new driveway. That's the only way it could be done without there being substantially more detriment to my client. Um, I just don't see why we're here. I mean, this application makes no sense when you read the language. Read your definitions. Read structures, read the definition of prior non-conforming use, prior non-conforming structures, they all talk about a single structure. And if, if, you, if they argue, well, this is an accessory structure to the main structure, it isn't anymore. The read your definition of accessory structure. It says it can only be an accessory structure if it does not contain a um, kitchen or a bathroom. Somebody's already illegally put in a kitchen and a bathroom to this structure. It is no longer an accessory structure by your very definitions of your bylaws, excuse me, your ordinances. So this can't work anyway. I'm just baffled as to why we are here with this application. I know the city planning is supporting it, but I think it's wrong. It's just as wrong as Dewey Court was and any land court judge would see it in a heartbeat. This doesn't apply here. Okay, thank you. Um, Attorney Lesser, do you, would you like to respond? Sure. You know, we've gone over, I went over with the planning department and I asked uh, Ms. Mish to, to chime in after I finish. But, it, but it's clear that there is a nonconformity in terms of the dwelling unit and that there'll be a greater nonconformity if there's an accessory dwelling unit and it's allowed under the zoning and as vociferously as Attorney McLaughlin argues, I think he's just simply wrong. And um, this has nothing to do with Dewey Court where he, he may indeed have been right. In terms of whether it's substantially more detrimental, right now, it's not a garage, it's a studio. 
means you can put classes in the studio. You can have uh, people coming and going in the studio. You can do all sorts of things in the studio. And it, the studio is an, is an allowed use at this point in time. And in fact, there'll probably be less cars than there would be in a studio. And in any case, the fact that somebody might have might have been more than four cars there parking there at one point in time, if they're all on Ms. Pollan's land, is immaterial. This, you need three parking spaces. And we as clearly shown we have more than four parking spaces. And if someone parks on her land, she's a remedy. She can come and have that car towed away. Um, there's a sign up there now which says no parking along the driveway. Since the sign has gone up, I'm not aware of any complaints. Uh, Ms. Robinson has put in speed bumps. This is all controllable. And um, there's, there's ample parking to create another driveway and take away green space on the other side of the house when there's cobblestones and you've seen the cobblestone area, the gigantic, makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, can I address a question for you to Brother Council? Uh, yes, of course. Um, could, could you ask him to point out in the language of the statute um, Two things. Number one, the, the statute says we can only make a change to a prior non-conforming structure and how this garage is a prior non-conforming structure. And secondly, can you ask him to answer why he told the planning board something totally different than he's telling the zoning board today? I don't think that's true. Number one, Mc attorney McLaughlin keeps on saying that. What I told the planning board and what I'm telling this board is that the studio will become a non-conforming structure when an accessory dwelling unit is allowed in it. Uh, I, if uh, Carolyn Mish could talk a little bit to this issue, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, can I read from the memorandum uh, from the planning board? That wasn't what was said. I can read it to you, You're Mr. Chairman. what I said, this is not the time or place. I said that, I said it would be a non-conforming Structure, that's what I meant. That's what I've always told everybody. Obviously, it's conforming as a studio. That is not what you said, sir. I can read it to this board. I well, mean, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure for our purposes what was said or not said in front of another board is, is, is necessary to our analysis. But Mr. Chairman, he quoted, he quoted from the board's decision saying, look what they did, look what they did. They did because they gave them the wrong information. So of course, you know, I, I would, you would seem, it would seem to be relevant if he quoted at length from how good the planning board thought this was, they thought it was because he told them it was something other than it is. That's just not true. Well, well I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't right. think that we, our board needs to get pulled into um, sort of a, a, a dispute over what was or was not said. Whatever happened at the planning board is not dispositive for what happens in front of this board anyway. Um, and I also am a little bit reluctant for this board to sort of get pulled into what is sounding to me like perhaps an ongoing dispute between two neighbors. I think that's setting aside for the moment, Attorney McLaughlin, your argument that, um, that a plain reading of the ordinance um, throws into question the request that's being made. Leaving that aside for a moment, um, I'm sense uh, that the, 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 the standard for a finding is not substantially more detrimental. And in my mind, at least speaking as one board member, um, substantially more detriment is that phrase is not intended to be triggered by what is sounding to me now, reading between the lines, as a private dispute between two abutting landowners with respect to the burden or overburdening of a shared driveway. And I see that that easement goes back to 1959, that shared driveway easement. That's um, but Mr. Chairman, I mean, when people come in for findings, they usually don't have a shared driveway. And that is something you can clearly and unequivocally take into account. 
If somebody says, but, I want to put a second family thing on my on my property and it's my driveway, yeah, that's fine. But if it's somebody else's driveway that you're sharing, that can clearly be substantially I think it more goes detrimental. To the, I think it goes to the issue, the separate legal issue between the parties as to whether this creates an excessive burden on the subservient estate, which is the neighbor, your client's property. Um, but I don't know that that equates with uh, or, or overlaps with the analysis of uh, whether uh, relief that's granted or a proposed improvement is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, in my mind anyway, I just, uh, I, that standards is, is intended and you can go ahead and cite language. I, I welcome that, but in, it, we have, let me just say this board has always, this board has always taken into account in applying this substantially more. And I know this is just one piece of the dispute and the analysis here, but applied the standard of substantially more detrimental to, in my phrase, the characteristics of the neighborhood the impact on density to the neighborhood, not so that it, quite often, frankly, we have one neighbor, one abutting neighbor withstanding who has um, a, um, an objection to a proposed improvement or to a request for a finding in this case. Um, but the fact that one neighbor has a perceived slight or perceived um, uh, uh, opinion that, or an opinion of a, you know, that, that this unduly impacts that one property. To me, that's different than the standard of substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Otherwise you could always have one neighbor vetoing anything that the board does. That is true, that is true. But the abutters are the most important neighbors. And I believe there are other and butters. And they have stand, that's why they yeah. have standing. I and there are other I butters know. who have a problem with this. And, yeah. um, but but we should never get there. The statute that Brother well, Council has brought before no, the board I, I, says, I understand your analysis. Um, this has let me, I mean, let me point one other thing out. And, and mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, sometimes there are mistakes in the, or at least ambiguities in the in the language of the ordinance. And you're right. From time to time, those get cleaned up out of necessity or when they've been brought to light. I'm not saying whether I agree that's the case here, but I will say this. I've been on this board almost 20 years. We have, I, I can say from personal experience on this sitting on this board, that we have always taken the whole locus as the unit that identifies or that, that triggers the determination that there's a non or in this or a pre-existing non-conformity. And I understand your, your point. Your argument is that the non-conformity, the pre-existing non-conformity in terms of the structure has to do with, would have to do with the garage and back. But we've, all I'm telling you is that historically, we have taken a situation like this and we have said, if the house in front is non-conforming, that makes the, the low, that non-conformity extends to the locus. I'm just telling you what, what we've done historically. You'll, you're gonna tell me it's incorrect, but- I'm gonna tell you it's incorrect because of your own definitions. Maybe there weren't lawyers involved for neighbors at, at, at any of those points. I mean, your own definitions talk about structures as separate and distinct. They talk about a, a, a single family building as being a separate and distinct building. I mean, even if somehow some judge said, well, you know, um, because everybody, he, Brother Council wants to use 10, section 10, because in section 10, it's the only section that allows you to, to grant the finding with new nonconformities. And this would have a big nonconformity. You'd be allowing the, the house, the second house to be five feet away when the city council has just said that they wanted 15 away. So it's a big nonconformity you're trying to let in through section 10. And section 10 does allow you to do that, but section 10 clearly applies only to the single family structures. The last line tells you what you're, what you're supposed to compare it to. 
and Brother Council is free to read the statute, but I mean, it says that you're, you, the, you're supposed to, when you do your test, when you're comparing the garage before and the garage after, using this statute, we would never talk about the garage now. The garage doesn't get talked about because it says for this statute uh, will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming single or two family structure. That's what this statute says. This statute is about the single or two family structure, not every other building that happens to, happens to be on the property. Right, no, I understand. I mean, I, I, read, I read your memo. The, um, but Carolyn, Mish, do you, do you have any, any, any input you'd like, you'd like to offer here? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, a couple of things, I guess is, you know, this is a different section of the statute. It hasn't, it's, it's uh, more recent than the standard finding. This is a special permit. So it's not the same voting as, as a different, as another finding because you're, you're looking at the increase in the nonconformity. So um, the house is, you know, less than 10 feet from the lot line. So in this situation, you're evaluating the house, meaning a res the residential component, the residential structure coming closer to the lot line. So that's the context in which you have evaluated other projects, as you mentioned, and um, as well as and so th in this case, you're, you're essentially being asked to evaluate going from a nine foot setback to a five foot and change setback. Um, so it would be very similar to if someone came and asked for an addition to the house attached to the existing structure where it is now moving closer to the lot line um, or, for instance, connecting the um, existing detached structure um, that by itself as a detached garage um, does meet the setbacks, but then you would be making it non-conforming by um, attaching it to the house. So um, it's very similar to um, some other um, special permit applications that have been, have been before you, again, to sort of expand that non-conformity bringing it closer to the lot line in a structure and it still is applicable to a single family or a two family situation, not to any other type of use in um, that might be on a property. If I could, Mr. Chairman, sure. can I read the definition of single family? Yeah, and can you, give me the, can you give me the ordinance? exact si the site I've yeah, got the it's, ordinance it's, in front of me? Yeah, well, unfortunately, all the definitions are listed under 350-2.1. You have hundreds of them. Okay, but yeah. but, but uh, the single family, one family, a detached building, singular, a detached building containing one dwelling unit also referred to as single family dwelling. All right? You know, when you use words in a statute, you have to obey them. I know it's not what the city wants. It's clearly not what the applicant wants. And the other thing is they say, well, what is an accessory structure? But the accessory structure, it's not a legal accessory structure because the applicant illegally has already turned it into an illegal non-accessory structure by her own actions. Well, she that's, says, that's, that's, that's just ridiculous. Um, you know, read the, not, can I read the definition of accessory structure, sir? It's not in use. It's been a studio. It continues to be a studio. The uh, the uh, the bathroom kitchen will be would, bathroom would be removed if you don't grant this permit. It would become an accessory structure, which is a studio again. Right, and, and it says that no, no accessory structure, but it, but it didn't nope. didn't become anything other than an accessory use, an accessory structure when that bathroom was put in. It's not connect. It's right. So, well, the, the, well, but right, right now, it's not an accessory structure. Right now, it is an right, by your definition, it is not an accessory structure. The, the other thing I want to point out is they keep talking about how you are going to make it non-conforming through your actions. Read the definitions of non-conforming use. Read the definitions of non-conforming structures. No planning board or zoning board can ever create a pre-existing non-conformity. Only the city council can do that by you're doing something legally 
and then the city council passes an ordinance, but you were doing it legally before the city council passed that ordinance. That's how that nonconformity is created. You can't like create nonconformities through your action and then give people relief because they're nonconformities. That's tautological and it's just irrational. I mean, the entire thing is wrong. And I hate to say Dewey Court, but it's just like Dewey Court again. They come here with a statute that doesn't work at all. City tells you to pass it and you know we want more density or whatever. So we don't read the law. You guys are sworn to obey the law, not the city. Read it. It's been okay. a for this way for 20 years, Trent. And um, it correctly. Just bear with me here. I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get my phone on speaker because I had to plug it in because the power is running out. So I had to unplug my earbuds. So I apologize. Let me just see if I can figure out how to do that. While I'm doing this, um, I might ask if there are any other members of the public in the waiting room who would like to address the board about this application. Hi, I would like to. Leslie Giordano. Okay, and your address, please. I know we see your name on the survey, but. 12 West Sutter Street. Okay. And I'm gonna um, yield to my husband because he's the one who's done most of the work in terms of researching and whatnot. Um, so this is David Hardy and he lives on 12 West Center Street with me and our daughter. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I lost. Hello? You're muted. Okay. And then yeah. we... Okay. Yep. Um, yes, we are the direct abutters of the total length of the garage. And um, we are very upset about the setback being infringed upon as a residential unit. Um, there are five windows. We, there was a question about windows, but I'll start with that. There are five windows that are three by four feet each that look out on our property from both the north and west side of the building. Uh, during the summer, there is a deciduous shrubs that offer some buffer, but during the winter, it is totally open. So it's sort of like being in a fishbowl. Um, we're concerned about the parking issue that how it affects our other neighbors. Uh, if you notice from the plot drawing, her, uh, Ms. Pollen's parking is a triangle. She drives a car that is 17 feet plus in length over. And if you look at the dimensions of the parking lot, you can see that her car alone creates problems. And I don't think, judging from the scale drawing, I'm not even sure her car will fit in her garage. Um, and I can't weigh in on whether the building is conforming or non-conforming. However, I did email Carolyn a copy of some, a summary of the state laws on changing the use in non-conforming build, buildings and there is a three-part test that is used there. I can't cite the law, but I would encourage you to look at it because if any of the three tests are, are not met or fail, uh, the building loses the privileges it grants from being non-conforming. So that is an issue. Um, Leslie, do you have anything to say? Oh, the other thing is I did email Carolyn a letter of concern that was signed by 15 people on the abutters list. Three 
of the properties that are direct abutters are in opposition to this plan. So it's not simply a personal dispute between one abutter and the applicant. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's all I have I'll, to I'll oh. say. Something. Um, hi, this is Leslie. Um, and I don't have uh, I don't have personal issues with Jen. Um, I feel like this whole thing has been really hard for me because we get we have gotten along. Certainly, it's not. I think that at both hearings, I keep hearing about how people need to get along and blah blah blah. And we have gotten along. Our dogs played together. Um, I'm sorry that it rose to this level. Um, I don't feel like Jen has been a team player with us. Uh, my, my husband in the very beginning asked if she was building in there. We, we lent her, um, my husband is a handyman. We lent her materials to use. We had no idea what she was doing. She was not upfront about that. Um, we've tried to brainstorm. She asked us, what do I need to do to make this work for you? We talked about having a driveway coming in from the other side, the side sidewalk is cut and it could have been done. It didn't have to take up a whole lot of green space. It's a beautiful yard with lots of green space. And she said, I'm not doing that. This is my property, I'm gonna do what I want. And I think um, that's the part that's hardest for us is that if we could trust that she wasn't gonna then go back to you guys and say, I'm gonna add a second story or I'm gonna, you know, she's been encouraged by, by uh, by the last at the last meeting to put another another um, building on her property because she has so much it's a whole lot in the back which is beautiful and filled with beautiful gardens and it would I would hate it if a six foot uh, fence went up because looking out there is really beautiful and that's why we bought the house you know that's one of the reasons and we've fixed it up for years and years and years and I don't have a lot of money I've worked really hard to to make this house, it was a dump when we bought it. And my husband has worked on it as a, you know, he's a carpenter, he's done most of the work when he's not doing that work for other people. So we'd like to have trust. And um, I, I guess I don't feel so trusting at this point. And the way it's, it, Catherine, Catherine Robinson has been here for years and she's our friend and she's in her eighties and she's always, stood by us and when we put our um we raised the roof on this house because it was a it was a um you know a, a, a cape with just uh one and a half stories and we raised the roof and we had to go through the city we did everything legally um we went to all our neighbors we had to go through this whole process and um it, that was 20 how many years ago i don't know like uh, you know 10 12 years ago um, and we want to stay here. This is where this is our home. We love Florence. We want to have good relationships. We have a, a very tight neighborhood. Our neighborhood is very tight and it's been hard because David did a petition and then Jen went out with her own when rebutting all he, what he said. And I don't want to see our neighborhood divided. We have a one thing that's so beautiful about Florence is there isn't one person in this neighborhood who wouldn't help each other out when the other person was on vacation or whatever, or needed child care or whatever. Okay. All right. I, we're, I think I think we'll try to stick to maybe a little closer to, to issues that are relevant to the analysis that the board has to make, but I appreciate what you're saying. Hmm. Uh, um, any, is there anyone else who would uh, yeah. uh, go no. ahead? I have one last I mean, thing that might be. Sure. sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. The first thing when we came to look at the property like 20, 20 years ago, um, that the realtor told me was he said, don't worry about this garage here because it's only a um, studio where the person who lived there at that time um, did book binding. So I don't know that it was ever even deemed a studio. And I, I actually really enjoyed the studio. I really enjoyed the dancing and the music and all that um and i wish we could have worked together to make this more palatable because it's gotten not so pretty mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you um anyone else is there anyone else who would like to have a chance to speak oh i have one thing i'd like to <laughs> add and that the day before the planning board hearing jen talked to my wife and i and 
she said we were not to worry that she had been a landlord and she was not interested in being a landlord again. And her proposed use for the space was as a guest house for her parents when they were in town and as a a place for out of town artists to stay when they were offering workshops in her dance studio. And this doesn't sound too bad to me. However, it's not congruent with the changes in the zoning laws that are trying to create housing. So I see why people are talking about detriments versus what's gained. I don't see that the community gains or the neighborhood gains anything from this change in use in the structure. That is all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. anyone Chairman, else? Can, can I just uh, point out that that clearly shows that it's not just Ms. Robinson who is in severe opposition to this. Uh, I believe he said 15 out of your butters list. And, and the other issue that it raises when you talk about neighborhood is what we're talking about with the parking in the driveway. Maybe she won't park in our you know driveway and maybe you know, the four spaces is enough, but it, it's already filled with four parking, pe poor people parking there now. That's going to lead to on street parking, which is clearly detrimental to the neighborhood. It's not substantially detrimental, but it's substantially more detriment than what we have now. Uh, and the, the other issue is remember, according to this statute, if you find some bizarre way to use this statute, you're supposed to weigh by the very language of the statute, not the use of the garage as a studio versus it becoming a home, but the, the fact that the front building is a few feet over into the side yard. That's what the statute says. That's hardly any detriment at all. That's, and that's what you, you're not supposed to measure as brother counsel said, well, you know, it's this dance studio. It's not that bad. You're not supposed to measure that. Your statute, which doesn't apply, but if you read the language, says what you're supposed to measure is the detriment from the single family structure being a few feet in to putting a second home in the garage. That's much more detrimental, substantially more detrimental. The, the few, you know, read the statute. I mean, don't just listen to uh, the planning department. Sometimes they're not right. I mean, they're not lawyers, you know, and they, and they say what the city wants. That's what the city wants, you know. And they're just wrong on this one. I'm sorry, but they're just wrong. The statute doesn't apply here. Right. And when you do okay. your measurement, don't measure it. You're measuring apples and oranges because the statute doesn't apply. You're not even measuring the use of the garage now with the use of the garage afterwards. The statute says if you use it the way you should, it, I mean, you shouldn't, but if you use it, it says you're supposed to measure the fact that the single family home structure is a couple feet off and measure that the detriment to that, which is minimal, as to putting a second family in the garage on a shared driveway, which is substantially more detriment. That, hmm. you know, it's a bizarre situation. The language is crazy because it doesn't apply. Right, okay, um, thank you. Um, and any, I just wanna make sure anyone else who wants to speak has a chance to do that. Is there anyone else who, who wants to speak and uh, or add something perhaps that hasn't been said or otherwise wants to speak i would i would just this petition has been brought up and if you read the words of the petition number one it talks about an existing garage not a studio number two it says there's no driveway number three it says there's limited parking it's just filled with inaccuracies and it was talked about that jen pollins went around in the neighborhood and she found four or five people who said, if I'd known the true facts, I never would have signed that petition in a million years. Um, so yeah, it's the question is, mm -hmm. who is here tonight? And there are two neighbors here tonight and there's no one else from the neighborhood here tonight. Okay. It, and I just wanna confirm that. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken who, who uh, wants to speak? I just wanna make sure everyone's had an opportunity. Carolyn, are we seeing anyone else or? Maybe. I don't see okay. anybody, but let me just take another peek. Um, I, um, in my view, I don't see anybody, but um, you know, someone can call out. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't see anybody. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions for Carolyn, if I may. Yeah. Sure. Um, maybe for you, David. Um, 
the, the, this issue of, uh, I have not been on the zoning board for the number of years the other, you other two have been. So forgive me if I, this information I just am getting up to speed on, but the distinction between a non-conforming building and a non-conforming parcel seems critical to this. And we have, we have always gone by um, the premise that we don't make a decision based on precedent. We make it based on the matters at hand, the right, appeal at they're hand. They're so fact specific. Right. Correct. So I, I, I'd like to hear from, I guess from Carolyn on that distinction, because it does seem kind of seminal to this. Um, sure. I mean, I think, uh, and John is correct, and, and my analysis um, and my suggestion to you all in my staff report is, yes, you're looking at the non the, um, the nonconformity of the existing house, and you're comparing that to the proposed nonconforming residential structure, which would be closer to the lot line. So that's where you have to um, evaluate whether is the nine feet from the lot line changed to a five foot from five feet from the lot line substantially more detrimental than the existing nine feet? That's absolutely clear. That's in the statute, and that that's that's what you're evaluating. And so you're looking at the conditions um, on the property. Um, it would become what we define in the zoning as a two-family. It would go from a single to a two-family by adding a second unit. Um, we still call it a two family, even if it's detached. And again, as I mentioned, it's a, you know, separate permit path to get an approval for a detached unit. But at any rate, you, you know, it's not. Um, and again, I will say, sort of, this is a newer change in the last eight years, seven, seven, eight years, when this, the, um, judicial interpretation at the, you know, at the state level changed about what would be considered a finding that you could ask under a finding standard for increasing a nonconformity. So coming closer to a lot line. So the 2009 evaluation that was sent by David Hardy from Don Schmidt predates those changes in um, interpretation um, of the, and, and case law. Um, but that, so I don't know if that answers, you know, your question or if you have more. Well, it, it's specifically, can you request a, f a finding um, to a structure that is conforming, no. currently conforming simply because something, another piece, another structure on your property is non-conforming? Because right. it, you're you know, voicing, in, in you're, Florence, you're, you're, for example, the, almost every other piece of property has a non-conforming. Right. So it it does. I mean, this statute, the case law, and interpretation of non-conformities changed, um, and our subsequently our ordinance changed to basically put non-conforming structures and uses into a different sort of um, realm in that if you already have a non-conforming situation, then you can go to the board and ask for a new non-conforming situation on the property. Um, but if you have a conforming situation, then you have to remain conforming in all aspects. You can't then create a new non-conformity. Um, so it, um, you know, that's a shift in the way things have been evaluated the um but again so you you're really looking at the existing nonconformity of the house um no no one has um stated at this point in front of the zoning board that the detached structure is nonconforming you're really just looking at the residential component that that structure is nonconforming and the applicant is asking to make a greater nonconformity of residential um, structures and uses on the property by moving it essentially closer to the law line. Mr. Chairman, may I address Ms. Scanlon's question? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon, there is a separate and distinct provision for non-conforming lots where you, you can get 
a, a finding pertaining to a lot that is non-conforming. Usually it's a frontage, a lot doesn't have the required frontage, but it's been built on for years, or, or a lot uh, is missing the proper area, but it's been built on for years. And there, it deals with a lot. This statute does not deal with the lot. They are writing in language into this statute. This statute says you can change a prior non-conforming structure. The prior non-conforming structure is the single family home structure. Read the definitions of prior non-conforming use, read the definitions of prior non-conforming structures, read the definitions of structures. If this board has been dealing with it in another manner, I'm sorry, but I'm asking you to read the statute or have brother counsel read his way out of the statute. Because this, this statute says the only thing you can change, the only thing is a prior non-conforming structure. That's all you can change under the statute. Not um, non-conforming structures and any other buildings that have to be on the same property as non-conforming structures. That's not what the statute says. And that's, you know, and, and uh, Ms. Scanlon's right. If you say that if you've got any non-conformity in Florence, and then you can come in and just ask for a finding and no longer obey the, the ordinances, just get a finding. You're gonna have people making every garage into a home when the statute by its plain language says you can only change a prior non-conforming structure. This is not a prior non-conforming structure, even though in writing it was said that it was a prior non-conforming structure in the planning board. The story has changed and, and now we have to deal with it. And this statute doesn't work. It simply doesn't work at all. May I ask, um, I'll, uh, I'll ask David first and then he can uh, recognize who else might want to address this um, about changing of a, a use rather than discussing changing a structure. Um, right. Because, I think that's what Carolyn was alluding to. Yes. When but, I'm but, hearing but, about but. changing uh, changing a structure, it's almost as if we're uh, picking up a conforming um, structure and uh, dropping it closer to the property line because now it's in a different use or something like that. Um, so uh, I think that's what this yeah. all comes down to that, you know, is is attorney McLaughlin's analysis the correct one based on a strict reading of the language of the, in the ordinance, it, it, according to his, his interpretation, his, his argument, um, which is that because the structure that's where the use is being altered, meaning the garage, because that structure was never non-conforming, the applicant can't hang her hat on the fact that the house in front was a non-conforming structure in order to qualify to get a finding with respect to the change in use in the garage and back. I mean, that that is your argument, right? That, that is, but, it, but also when you talk about use, when you talk about use, the statute talks about use. The only use you can change is a prior non-conforming use. And that's not what's going on in the front building. You've got to get it out of your minds. Prior non-conforming uses are bizarre things. That's where somebody has a store in a residential neighborhood or somebody has a factory in a commercial neighborhood or those are prior non-conforming uses. The using your house for a home where the house itself is a prior non-conforming structure is That's not right. a prior right. non-conforming so, use. I understand. So, 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 so the other, the other you argument- You can't the other, change the use of this structure under this statute. But the other, the other argument or position that I, I think I'm hearing Carolyn describe is that this is also the expansion of, of a use and in a way that creates a non-conformity because that use would not otherwise be allowed in the garage and back without the finding. Right, but, but this board doesn't have the power to create any, any non-conformity. We, <laughs> we have some discretion for we can uh, evaluate new encroachments and 
Um, but that doesn't make them prior. That doesn't make them prior nonconformities. A prior nonconforming use is defined in your statute. It's a use that was in existence when the ordinance changed. Are you you, you, all saying? you can in this statute only allows you to change those kind of uses, prior nonconforming uses or prior nonconforming structure. You can change nothing else under the words of the statute. You can't just change a use to whatever you want because there's a prior nonconforming structure somewhere on the property. No, I think I think what I heard Carolyn mm -hmm. saying, and I'll, I'll let her speak for herself, is mm -hmm. we have a property that includes a nonconforming structure. That's the house in front. On yeah. that property, the applicant wants to expand the residential use, not a prior nonconforming residential use, but expand the oh, use. I'm right. You, um, how can you do that under the statute? The statute only allows you to either change a prior non-conforming structure or prior non-conforming use. It doesn't allow you to change a, a no, legal it's use. Not changing anything? But no, it's already allowed to have one or two families residential use. But but your this statute only allows you to change a prior non-conforming use or a prior non-conforming structure. It doesn't allow you to allow a use that would require a variance. Under this statute, this statute is only for changing prior non-conforming well, structures or uses. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 uh, we hear your arguments. Um, I, I think the only other thing to, to say is, you know, Attorney Lesser, do you have anything else you want to say? Because, um, because the arguments that Attorney McLaughlin are making are very clear, um, which, um, and so I, I want, I guess I want to give Attorney Lesser an opportunity, you know, to, to make any further response that he wants to make. Sure. So, I mean, Section 10 talks about specifically about a new zoning violation, such as uh, new setback encroachments. And that's really what we're talking about. We're going to end up with a new setback encroachment when we make it into an accessory dwelling unit. And Marilyn is totally right that when you have the building in front and it's a nine foot encroachment and you can have you can make a finding that turning the building in the back into another encroachment is some, it's just fine and it's allowed by right as an accessory dwelling unit in that neighborhood without the encroachment and it's just really form over substance here in which he's trying to say yeah, you have to you have to either connect it or you have to move it or and then it'll be totally fine, of course, you know, put a walkway between the two. Um, and it just doesn't make any real sense as a matter of practicality. And I think the statute can be interpreted as Carolyn's interpreted and as the board is interpreted, as David talks about for the last 20 years as a uh, looking at the whole locus rather than looking at a discrete part of it. And, but, you have a kind, and John, you've said your piece at mm -hmm. least 25 times, you know, yep. it's really not necessary to keep on repeating it and particularly not necessary to interrupt me. And you're just going to say the same thing that you think the statute reads in a way that I, Carolyn, don't think it reads and it's up to the board to decide how it thinks it reads. I'm just asking you to, using the language of the statute, to explain the first sentence of the statute. The first I'm going to be interested in our chairman controlling our All right, I'm sorry. discussion. Thanks. Well, I, I think I think we know what the positions are, and and we, you know, we're a volunteer board. We have to do the best we can do to render a decision, and then you know the parties on one side or the other have whatever rights they have, uh, rights of appeal, et cetera. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, in some cases, this is what judges are for, to, uh, to uh, make a final ruling as to which interpretation of the statute is right and which interpretation of the statute is wrong. Which would um, be I have uh, one more question and I don't even know who it's to. Um, the, uh, 
the driveway, which is not actually a shared driveway, but it's a driveway owned by the abutter with an easement granted. Um, I, I'm interested in knowing when that easement was granted, was the um, applicants, uh, was the zoning already at that point um, allowing two family residences on the property? I think it predates the zoning ordinance because it goes back to 1959 and the ordinance was in 75, I want to say. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming without further research, Maureen, that, that there, uh, this, this, that, that, that mm. we can't really answer the question to the yeah. extent that yeah. the easement predated the ordinance by, you know, 15 to 20 years. It's, um, excuse me, but uh, 76 was the most recent codification there, there's uh, ordinances going back way, well into the 1950s and earlier in Lilly Library and Forbes Library. Right, but it would take some some yeah. research of the legislative record to, I think, if yeah. I'm understanding your question, Maureen. Yeah, I would just add that I don't think that it um, David is. David submitted. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I don't think it really is relevant of what was allowed at the time the easement was right, created. Right. There's, and, um, I think yeah. David noted that there's private, um, you know, um, language about um, it, the easement and, and whether there's an overburdening of an easement of a change of use, because it happens all the time where easements granted 150 years ago you know, are still in place and they're really about access to properties. And mm -hmm. that's where yeah. people- Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a matter of, of private, you know, uh, exchange right. between the parties to yeah. the easement. Yep. yep. Um, and private, okay. you know, rights uh, to-, to uh, um, So- um, well, One other clarification, and I, mm -hmm. I think this is my last. Sure, <laughs> um, sure. I'll have to. The I just heard uh, someone just meant refer to this as an accessory unit, but it's not an accessory unit, right? It's a second residential unit on the property. Correct. Second okay. residential unit on the property. We've sort of, um, I mean, it's smaller. So I think, and, and in the old, in language up until this year, we might have referred to it anything under 900 square feet as being accessory, but it's no longer the case. Okay, and I had thought of accessory unit as one that uh, uh, requires a condition that the owner occupies the other unit on the property, and that that that's what led me to understanding the uh, distinction here. Yeah. Now, as a reminder, we would need a unanimous vote of all three of us to approve the request, the applicant's request. Um, well. Uh, question something uh, caught my ear. There was some discussion about the um, the existing versus proposed windows. Perhaps Attorney Lesser can uh, tell me there were a couple of photos where we could see that there's um, on the north side of the garage uh, facing uh, Mr. Hardy's home. There's a, a window from garage bay and then another window further down. Um, but is that what we saw on the floor plan or are there, um, uh, it also sounded like there were a lot of windows. So is, is that a current photo and how many windows are facing which way? There are two photos facing the garage actually of Mr. Hardy behind his garage is a house and there are two windows. One is in the garage, one is in the studio. And um, that's when I said, if they'd like it, we're happy to put up a fence and then they won't see those windows anymore. And they indicated they don't wanna put up a fence. They don't want a fence put up. Well, yes, whether it was a, a fence or plantings or less windows or other mitigation isn't isn't what's before us at the moment but i wanted that clarification thank you they're just those two windows wait give me 
I think uh, that, that's it for the moment. It looks Thanks. like David is trying to answer, but he's muted. No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm just yeah. thinking. No, I mean, David Hardy, um, oh. Leslie and David. Oh, I would like to address there are, I think, five windows on the west side of the building where our yard is visible, and they are all within the setback. And each of them is three by four feet. <laughs> Facing your house or facing the yard? It's it's it looks like you have a double lot. At an angle, they are all face they're all they all you can look out onto our yard from all of them. Because that I'm sure it's a nice view. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but Mr. Hardy, it, if you could unmute again, um, did attorney Lester speak? correctly when he said that you or you or or i'm sorry i forgot the name of the woman you were with um miss miss giordano um do not want a fence uh, I, I would not want a six foot tall fence with no you know ar or or visuals between the posts you know what I mean? like a stockade fence that would be really ugly. everybody has really cute picket fences around here just saying. I'm not sure there's even enough setback there to put in a fence. Yeah, well, there's not. It's really close. There's a court, the corridor between between the garage and our fence is, you know, very narrow. And there are also existing uh, compressors and generators and that sort of thing that are attached to the dwelling within the setback. I, I'll just say one thing, hi. Um, there already is a fence there, so we would just be putting a bigger privacy fence up because there's because there's uh, there's be, there's because there's a need for privacy that we're hearing about. So we're trying to address that. Okay, thank you. Sarah, you're muted. Thank you. Is there a DPW opinion or any notes from them about septic or anything like that? Uh, no, there were no comments either for the planning board or for the zoning board. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn, can we go back to a point that I think has been made? And that is, are you suggesting that once the planning board granted its approval, the garage structure became a residential use or effectively a second unit? Um, I, nothing's happened yet because there are two permits required and they're right. completely independent of each other. Okay. But, um, the planning board evaluated its permit through a site plan review for the purposes of creating a second unit on the property. It's not considered, um, by definition, it's not called an accessory unit, it's just called a, a second unit or two family. It's sort of all wrapped into that single definition. So um, the um, planning board granted it under its jurisdiction, looking at it in the uh, under that view as a sort of ha um and and aside from the setbacks knowing full well that the zoning board had to also grant um a permit that would allow a reduced setback for residential uses and that's why it says that's that's why there there's a two permit path here but um so if the zoning board grants a permit the applicant also has a permit from the planning board that allows for a detached second unit because anytime someone is proposing a second unit on a property that's not attached to the um, um, existing unit on the property, then that triggers site plan review. Okay. And, and Carolyn, we've heard attorney Lester's response. Just before we see if we can make a decision here, can you again give me your response to attorney McLaughlin's specific argument that the letter of the ordinance says 
that the um, that a finding can be granted for the expansion or alteration of a non-conforming structure. But in this case, the only non-conforming structure is the house in front. And that is not the structure that is the subject of this application. Does it bear that this is a special permit and not a finding? Is a finding. Uh, Carolyn, you're muted. Yes. So Sarah, it's you're special permit. correct that it's a special permit. Um, it's a special permit in which the board has to make certain, you know, the certain finding, but it's a special permit because um, it's a new zoning violation that's I'm being sorry, created. I, I distracted from, uh, uh, from David's very important question. And um, what, what is the new zoning violation? Because Attorney McLaughlin's argument is that the only pre-existing nonconformity is the structure in front, and that's not relevant to what is the proposed change here, because that relates only to the structure in back, which is a conforming structure. So it's your, I mean, meaning a new zoning violation, like a new setback encroachment. So this is a new setback encroachment because it's closer, it's not. So normally under a finding, which is required, which is a lower threshold and requires you know, two of three votes, you're looking at, at an extension or expansion, either vertical on that same non-conforming setback line. It could be a use, it could be a structure. Um, in fact, if it's a, um, um, it could also include a, a detached structure that's on the same non-conforming plane as the existing one. Um, but this is a special permit because the request is to go closer and it, it is, um, a, you have a non-conforming residential structure and the request is to essentially make the residential structure closer and again, You've looked at these in um, either through a finding lens, meaning that you're maintaining that same um, non-conforming plane, either horizontal or, or um, vertical, or you've looked at it in, um, and that can be a detached structure that is also being requested um, under that purview, or a special permit, which this is because it's more you're moving it closer. So. I, you know, I understand that, um, I, I understand his argument that it's, um, that you can't look at it because it's a new structure, but that's not, um, that the fact is that you're being, the reason why it's in front of you is because it can't be done by right, but there's a special permit provision for an expansion or a new encroachment because one already exists on the property. On a different structure. And you, Carolyn, not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm just looking for any helpful input. Attorney McLaughlin has also argued that the fact that, and the fact that 15 people or something like that, 10 to 15 people signed a petition and we've heard from a couple of the neighbors. Um, now, Attorney Lesser point, has, has raised the question of whether some of the people who signed the petition might have changed their mind if they had more information. We don't have any more evidence or testimony on that point. But one of, I think one of Attorney McLaughlin's other arguments is even if we reject his argument about, and Attorney Lesser, you're, you're welcome to respond to this too. Even if we reject his argument about the strict reading of the ordinance requiring us, re prohibiting the, the, the 
application of a finding analysis or the, the uh, availability of a, of, a, of a finding as a remedy. Um, his other argument is that we have more than just two neighbors. Maybe, one, maybe a dispute with one neighbor does not make something substantially more detrimental. But if we have 10 to 15 neighbors who signed a petition indicating they object to this, is that stronger evidence that we should take into account that mm. maybe this is substantially more detrimental? Well, Any I mean, I guess I would say, you know um, that this is not a democratic decision. It's not who, how many people come on either side wins. You need to evaluate the issues. And um, so the issues you've heard are about parking, um, and so um, you've heard about potentially, um, so you, I mean, what you're looking at is whether or not the change is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood based on the issues, not based on how many people have said they agree with that issue. So parking is, is um, an issue that was raised. However, the applicant is showing that they're meeting the parking requirements and if there's and and the same issues were brought to the planning board's attention and the planning board asked the applicant or the abutter whether any action had been ever taken if there were parking <laughs> problems blocking the driveway sort of that becomes a private matter obviously you've talked about that already but the answer was no nobody's ever called anybody to complain about a problem of cars blocking the driveway um there's also um even if the owner had four cars parked legally on their own property, um, there is on-street parking, which is absolutely allowed everywhere in the city, except on streets that are um, where it's prohibited. And in fact, we like on-street parking because it's a form of traffic calming. So there's nothing illegal about having, I mean, everywhere in the city, when people have guests come over, those guests don't park in someone's driveway. They park in the street when they're coming to visit their friends. Um, so, um, you know, you need to decide, are those parking issues that 15 people signed on to a petition, are they, do they rise to the level of being um, an issue that, you know, weighs into your decision about um, whether something's substantially more detrimental or not. The other issue about proximity of the structure to the lot line, it's really about the proximity of the structure to the lot line. And does it have, um, you know, is it substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing um, non-conforming structure on the property? And so you look at, you know, things that maybe aren't able to be mitigated if there is a window on that side, not the side where that's facing the backyard, but the side where the encroachment is. Um, is that an issue that is, you know, by changing the function of the interior use of the property into a residential use, does, is that rise to the level of being yeah. substantially more detrimental? Despite whether 10 people think it is or not, that's what you need to focus on. Not And, and, and I think those are the two issues really is sort of, I think the windows and the parking. And, and then I just want to answer the question there was a by the abutter saying, what if we can't trust this person? What if they add on a second floor and add another unit? Well, if they do that, that automatically is going to trigger another review by both the zoning board and the planning board. So that's not something that could just happen in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. it May, may I address uh, an issue that was raised? It, it seems like part of the problem, this is something I haven't spoken about this evening, but it was in my memorandum. The applicant should have gone, by your ordinances, should have gone to the building inspector before she made this application. She should have gone for a zoning permit. And I believe the building inspector would have told her, um, you're gonna need a site plan review approval and you're gonna need a variance. But she didn't go to the building inspector. That's the same officer who issued the cease and desist against her for, for putting in the kitchen and the bathroom without any permits at all, either plumbing permits, electrical permits. I mean, we, we'd have a much better read on things to, if the building inspector indeed agrees with my reading. I don't know if he does, but he, he 
he, when I spoke to him, he was amazed that they were coming for a finding on a building that wasn't a prior non-conforming structure. That's your building inspector. That's just dead wrong. We applied for a zone. We applied for the zoning permit. They said to go to site plan review. They said to get the special permit under this section. To say we didn't go to the zoning uh, building inspector for a zoning ordinance is dead wrong. Well, and that's what he, he told me that he didn't. Check the record. You did your okay. homework. You would see that it was wrong. Okay. But and but was there but was there a cease that. and desist for the bathroom work? Yes, I said that in the very beginning. She started to permit it. She started it to, to do something before it was permitted. She talked to the building inspector, and the building inspector said, Stop, you can't do anything else. She stopped, and you can't. And you have and then she applied for it. Uh, she, she submitted a zoning permit application, and the building inspector responded by saying that uh, she needed to go to the planning board and the zoning board for the. Exactly. Special. Okay. Exactly. And they said, and he said, listen, we'll address that at a later time after you get a decision. Uh, in the record. Uh, uh, this permit, John, you asked me, David, about the number of neighbors. Uh, Ms. Pollins can testify that she talked to four different neighbors who said they never would have signed it. Okay, they, that's they, beside they, the point. I want to point out that not only the bathroom right. and kitchen trying to finish without a permit yeah. mr hardy let's i'll let you speak mr hardy as soon as uh, mr lesser finishes his All thoughts right. go ahead and, and i'd have miss pounds testify since you said no one has testified on that david i'd have her testify at this point yeah i i would like to hear from her very briefly on that because i agree with carolyn that it's not just a numbers game the number of people but but um and, and is that it Tom, before I, I, I yeah, yeah. Gonna, she can she okay. can explain what they were told, the misrepresentations that they were that were made to her, them. Okay, and then so first we'll hear Mr. Hardy, and then I'd like to hear from Ms. Uh, Pollins. Uh, I would like to say that not only were the bathroom and kitchen put in without a permit, but the apartment was then rented and occupied. It was only after the cease and desist order came that the tenant moved out. And then during COVID, the, the apartment was occupied two more times. Okay. Uh, Ms. Pollins, did you want to uh, just uh, have, have any input here on one, very briefly, the question of the uh, petition um, and if there was anything else that was just stated that is not correct? Um, and then what? Yeah, there's a lot of things stated that weren't correct and it's getting late. So I'll just say that to you. And, you know, it's it's a tricky, yeah, that, that's a tricky line. Well, this is a I really, very hard, very, excuse I really, me. Yeah, sorry. It's, excuse, I'm sorry I interrupted, but it's obviously this is a very difficult decision for the board. So so I think it's appropriate in brief, briefly to have your viewpoint and and sort of all available information, especially if there, there are some points that you think were stated that are not correct. I, that I would like to hear from you and then we'll we'll try to wrap things up. There's, there's no kitchen in the unit. It was never rented. Um, I stopped work immediately. That was definitely a mistake as a new homeowner. I just didn't know about it, and when I found out, I immediately stopped. I'm gonna have to, you know, pay for those for the consequences of that now, and you know, that's I understand now. Um, the petition that was distributed was misleading. Many people um, who I spoke to are are in support of this change of status um, and don't want to get involved and feel really disheartened by the tenor of the neighborhood since this has started just since the petition nobody was going to get involved until the petition oh was distributed and the the petition says things that are just not quite true that are manipulative in a way so 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 um, um okay. so and that, that i can just share that and that there is several people that said they didn't even know what they were signing several people that nobody did show up tonight because a lot of people said, we don't want to be involved with this. We want our neighborhood to be supportive and we don't feel comfortable with this. 
And so, did you say you've never rented? You never had a tenant never occupying? Rented. No, I, I, no, I, I have, I had a, I had a friend staying in my front room, and we used the space as a studio. So that is what was happening. And um, there's no kitchen there. There is no kitchen. Okay. No, it, it, the only other thing I'll, I'll say is that it is plumbed. There's, there is a slop sink, and there is air, air conditioning. There is a heating unit already in. The premises it's also another thing is that there's not five windows there's only three windows in the back there's okay. just a lot of exaggerations happening and I, okay. I appreciate your time okay thank you thank you all right um i i'm i'll just direct my question to the to my fellow board members um i i i think we've mm -hmm. heard everything we're going to hear um <laughs> um uh so how do how do we feel first about first of all about closing the uh the uh well um public meeting so, yes yeah, so the option is options on the table are continue or close the public hearing um and after those two options we could be continuing to gather more information. I don't know that that would be uh, useful. Um, if we close the public hearing, uh, do we think we can come to a decision this evening, um, yay or nay, in either direction? Um, uh, frankly, uh, at three hours, most zoning meetings, we're kind of proud of ourselves. We uh, we tend to be efficient. We're all currently we interpret and enforce. We don't uh, get uh, and and we are proficient in the language. So I, I appreciate that about our board, and um, I am interested in closing it for the night and whichever yeah. whether yeah. it's continuing we, we it or making a decision. What do you think, Maureen? You're, You're muted. muted. Thank you. Um, I'm certainly comfortable closing uh, from discussion. I feel like we've heard all we're going to hear. Um, I'm curious about Sarah, when you say continuing, is there more information you would like to gather or David, you? Like what would well, we continue well, no. with? I was saying that those are the two options. That's, That's right. all. David? I think the only other possibility is to close the public hearing because there's really no need for any more input. But given the hour and perhaps the time we might want to, we can't, we're prohibited from talking among ourselves, but we can separately give some thought to everything we've heard. And uh, in my case, maybe take a closer look at the some of the language in the ordinance that's been cited and debated. Um, we, could, we could render a decision at the next meeting. That's a good I'm point. I'm just saying that's There's another nothing, option. Just because we like to be efficient, we don't always have to make oh a decision God, that's the same right. night. Right. We've heard a lot. There's a lot to digest here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, if we do close, I mean, either way, I don't need to remind the board members that we're prohibited from having any communications among ourselves as board members relating to the hearing and we're prohibited from talking to any members of the public or council for that matter about the hearing. We can each individually communicate individually with Carolyn, um, but, but that's it. And I would expect if there is more information, she would distribute it as normal. And David, when you, um, were you to look further into just you know research um for clarification's sake in the ordinances would you be able to share that your thoughts yeah, when we at next, the next convene oh, yes, at, yes at the okay. next meeting yeah the board can deliberate um publicly um based on and and, and discuss in front of the public but it has to be in an open meeting in compliance with right, open meeting right, right. Um, statute. Um, 
right? You, you can, can deliver, deliberate, deliberate further and then entertain yeah. a motion and, and, and make, make a decision. Carolyn, but when you, you go any? back, yeah, I was just going to say that's absolutely true. Um, you can, you can sort of cogitate on all the information that's been submitted as part of this public hearing comment, but you can't bring new, and once you close the hearing, you can't bring in new outside information, but you can only review what's been presented. Now we, and, and we could bring in new information if we continue again. Yes. Continue the hearing. You can, yes. You can um, bring, if you continue it, but that, that means it's open for all over again, whatever comments, unless you specifically narrowly defined it and say, you know, we'll allow new information, you know, on I mean, X, my, Y, and Z, but I don't know that, I mean, it sounds like you don't think there's new information. I don't think it makes sense to keep, I would I, recommend I that it doesn't make sense to keep it open to allow anyone and everyone to I, go and do more I research. Agree. I, I think my gut feeling is that we've been given, given a lot to think about, including, frankly, questions that have been raised about how we've done things in the past and 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 uh, relative to you know a at, at least a one proposed strict reading of of the language in our ordinance and um and to me that warrants some individual deliberation and then at the next hearing and open meeting uh public you know, shared, not public, but shared deliberation among the board members in, in an open meeting in front of anyone who wants to observe and attend. Um, I just, that's my gut feeling here because we've been, we've been handed a lot here and, you know, we always try to do the best we can to fulfill our responsibilities. And my feeling is that that would be appropriate um, and and perhaps even necessary to take some time to to digest what we've heard. I concur, Mr. Mr. Chair. May, may I be heard on one issue? Um, I recently yeah. did a I recently did a uh, a finding. It was a finding where um, the board closed the meeting for the uh, allowance of new evidence, but still allowed um, the participants to talk in on legal issues and legal arguments when they came back. Um, I, I would hope that we could do something like that, especially if you read the definitional sections and the sections of the pertinent ordinances, I would like to be able to be heard. And I, it's also somewhat unfair when you close the hearing, if the city can still speak, because we know what the city wants. I mean, it's almost like they're, they're not a neutral in this. So it, it would be unfair to have Brother Council and I not to be able to be heard when the city is in essence saying what Brother Council wants. I mean, they're not a neutral party in this. To say that no one else can speak, but Carolyn can speak in this particular instance where we're really getting to the, the, the guts of whether there's even an ability to do a finding here. I would like to at least to be able to be heard or ask questions or respond, maybe not give new evidence. Uh, this just I just did this in West Hampton not too long ago, where they closed for new evidence, but allowed counsel still the ability to speak and converse with the board. Right. I'd like to hear first from Attorney Lester and then Carolyn in response to that suggestion. Number one, I think Carolyn is, is a neutral giving you information. Number two, we understand John's position. It's not like he's going to come up with a new position. If he came up with a new position, that would be fine and new, new arguments, but to simply pound and pound and pound is not helpful. We understand right. what the position is. We understand yeah. that he has a reading of the statute. We understand exactly what the reading of the statute is. He articulated as clearly as he could. And we understand what the other argument is. So I don't think you need someone arguing with you. You come back. That just makes no sense to me. Right. And Carolyn, do you have any other input here? Um, yeah, I think the board just needs to determine whether they've had heard enough. Once you close the hearing, you cannot accept any um, outside mm -hmm. comments or new information from anyone else. Staff is not um, part of that. That's part of the legal uh, determination of what open meeting law is and what the requirements are for public hearings. So, um, 
you know, you, you guys decide, like, do you have enough information or don't you have enough information? And, but once you close the hearing, there's no more discussion coming in from the public. I think I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, which you can discuss, et cetera, uh, which is to continue this hearing to a date that we can determine. I would propose two weeks or, or the, the next normal um, uh, meeting time, which would be uh, Thursday, September, uh, what is it, 9th, 16th? It has to be the second Thursday in yeah, September. Yeah, the 9th. So uh, you're saying as a hearing, not as... Continuing the hearing. Continuing the hearing. Not, not I think, um, I, I, for I, I, whatever I, reasons um, uh, of from um, any argument, there's no uh, there's no harm in continuing it. If you yeah, if, continue it, than wearing me out. Uh, if you're going to continue it, I'd really request that you go another two weeks. That's the date of my daughter's wedding ah. dinner. So I'd like to be there for that more than I'd like to be there <laughs> for this hearing. So if you could continue another two weeks, if you want to continue it, I'd appreciate it to the 23rd. That sounds valid. That would be all right with me. That's fine with me. Um, um, Let me check. I, I assume, Attorney McLaughlin, that's okay with you. It's just, uh, it's, I'm available. It's usually, yes. yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I mean, usually it's the applicant who wants to. Yeah. So um, the 23rd, is that, Carolyn, is that a second Thursday? It's I fourth. think that's the right. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, the fourth Thursday. So that works. Yes, it's, it's the fourth day. Thursday, but I just want to check to make sure it's not. Um, there's not another conflict. Um, let's see. Um, I don't see any other conflict and there's nothing scheduled right now. So you could okay. do it for seven o'clock or you could do it for 7.30, putting new items um, ahead at seven o'clock if you wanted to do that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no. You could do it at six instead of 5.30 so that anything new coming in, you could address at um, five if necessary. Um, okay. Uh, okay. But it's up to you. No, that's fine. The the, the one thought, I, I, I'm kind of thinking I agree with Sarah that by doing, first of all, we can very quickly close the public hearing on the 23rd. Um, we don't need another two or three hours. Um, but by keeping it open, I think we've addressed Attorney McLaughlin's concern. I'm not, I'm not um, acknowledging the validity or lack thereof of the concern, but we're addressing his concern that there would be unilateral, um, you know, there could be unilateral communication with the city. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm not, exactly. um, it, I'm not agreeing to, to the validity of that concern, but it's been a, it's a way to address it uh, in a way that I think satisfies various con interests here. Um, because we can always close, you know, determine as soon as we meet on the 23rd that, uh, you know, that, that we, you know, we can, we can move to close the public hearing, you know, on the 23rd as soon as we determine that there's no need for further input, which is a determination for the board to make. So my motion was to continue this public hearing to Thursday, September 23rd at 6 p.m. A second. PM. Okay, and a roll call, please. Uh, Maureen Scanlon? Yes. Sarah Norther? Yes. And David Bloomberg? Yes. And then I think we just need a motion to adjourn, right? Yeah. So, and so the public hearing is still open um, on that on that other matter. Uh, sorry, Sarah, you move to adjourn. Thank I you. I move to adjourn. I'll second. Oh, 
And also yep. just a reminder too that even though you continued the public hearing, there's still a bar on discussion amongst any, any conversations yes. or and with, the with public, anybody else. In yeah, the public with council, it, it's uh, anyone else, correct? Um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, I guess it's a roll call now just to adjourn. If there's no other, you know, business, yeah. Carolyn, that needs to be brought to anyone's attention. Okay, Maureen Scanlon. Yes. Sarah Northrup? Yes. And David Bloomberg? Yes. Okay, we'll adjourn till the 23rd at 6 p.m. Yep. And by, and by